Let me tell you something about doors. Any time you step through one, the arc of your life might change forever. You don't always know what lies behind it, but that's part of its beauty. Some mark new beginnings, first steps into the unknown. Others welcome you, tempt you, entice you. Then there are doors that show you a whole new perspective. A view of the world you could have never imagined. Sometimes though, there's a door that haunts you and taunts you and knocks you to your knees. But you get up, you fight back, and you overcome the obstacles that once seemed so daunting. Now you stride confidently through new doors without even knowing where they might lead. Because it's behind these guardians of the unknown that you will find opportunities, wonders that exceed your greatest expectations. And best of all, the choice is always yours. Which door will you open next? Which door will you open next? Which wonders will exceed your greatest expectations? These are some pretty big questions. So before we start with the big questions, welcome to the third Rejuveron Age Better, Live Longer Symposium. Thank you all for being here. I guess you're all here for a reason. Well, I'm here for a reason too, but my story is a little different. My story is actually a love story. And my love story started six years ago when I found myself spending Friday nights in bed with my laptop watching science talks on longevity, not understanding a word that we're talking about and loving it. And this is a really weird thing to do on a Friday night, considering that I have a background in marketing communications, not science. So fast forward, I'm standing here on this virtual stage together with some of the scientists I've been gushing over. And we have a spectacular lineup of speakers today. So thank you very much for supporting us. But I have to set my story straight. So my story is not just all about gushing. My infatuation with science actually inspired me to get a certificate in genetics from Harvard Medical School, which ultimately led me to Rituberon, where we help people age better and live longer. Just to set the stage for everyone, I'm here at our headquarters in Zurich. I'm in meeting room Greenland Shark. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have incredible lab spaces. We have phenomenal scientists who are not only experts in drug discovery, but also in drug development. So hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions related to our overarching issue, our overarching challenge that we're all living longer. Our lifespan is increasing, but unfortunately um, we're not getting any healthier. So our health span is actually decreasing. So hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions over the next three sessions. But if I can leave you with just one thing before we start, just one thing. It's that I truly hope that you too, if you haven't already, will fall in love with science. And now I'm gonna hand over to our highly esteemed science journalist and broadcaster, Vivian Perry. Well, hello everybody. And I'm so glad to be with Rejuveron once again. Uh, it's such a privilege to be able to host these events and I've been working on science reporting, well, for a very long time for the BBC and many others. And my interest in this area of science has grown and grown. And the quality of science in this area at the moment is outstanding and is growing all the time. 
So what we're going to do today is it follows the, the, the uh, things that we've been doing in previous sessions where we're going to have uh, a range of panel discussions in which you can be involved and you get to ask questions. So in the normal way, in the Q&A box, please, and I'll come to those during the actual uh, session. So we won't, we're not going to wait till the end. We'll, I'll try and incorporate them as we go along. We've got three sessions. One is how we go about funding this type of work, which is very important, as I know many of you are investors and think, what should I be asking? What should I be looking for? Uh, where is this all going? Uh, then we have another session where we're going to lay out before you some outstanding science and where this field is going and what the current state of play is. And then finally, we're going to look at how this all translates into real world medicines, interventions and treatments. And that's a very important part of the piece. It's not just enough to have bold ideas, you need to put them into practice too. So for our first session, and I've got three people here with a very different take on the funding and investment uh, requirements for this particular field, which in my experience is a field like no other. Uh, normally in many fields you get just one kind of funding uh, method. Actually, longevity and ageing work, it's quite different. So let me introduce you to our three speakers. Uh, first of all, we have Christian Angermeyer. He's the co-founder and chairman of Rejuveron and so, so much else. Uh, an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, through Aperion, uh, Aperion, his uh, investment group, his family office. Uh, he's interested in life sciences, in FinTech, in space, in crypto. In fact, there's almost nothing that Christian is not interested in. And I can't believe I'm going to say this about you, Chris, Christian, but and, and that I can even put the word conventional in the same phrase as Christian Angermeyer. <laughs> But you're going to present the more perhaps conventional aspect of fundraising and investment uh, in this piece. Then we'll have uh, Keith Comito. Uh, Keith is the founder and president of Lifespan.io, an advocacy organization for aging research. And for this session, I think we're going to concentrate particularly on his involvement in VitaDAO, which aims to fund aging research through cryptocurrencies. And then last but not least, we have Kevin Perrett. Uh, Kevin Perrett, many of you will know, is the co-founder of the SENS Foundation, which is a non-profit aiming to catalyze innovation in the aging space. Uh, he has a remarkable history behind him and a very different take again on how to advance uh, aging uh, uh, funding and uh, development uh, through a different form of funding. So let's start with you, Christian. Tell us a bit more about your take and what has fascinated you about this area. Well, I think like, I mean, I'm happy to say like, but it's almost so ob obvious because like, I think like biotech in generally and then longevity in um, uh, it's special, like it's such an obvious thing because who doesn't want to live longer and healthier? Like nobody would say no. Yeah. This is like, I think being healthy and happy. And then once you're healthy and happy to enjoy this life, which I think is very awesome. Yeah. For as long as you please, I think is sort of the deep desire of everybody. I think that's at the core of what we all want. And then everybody has other things. One, some people want to have, I don't know, job, cars, family, whatever, travel a lot, not travel a lot. Like, but it's sort of a sort of layer on it. But if you, I, I always say like, if you start, it's one of my favorite conversations at dinner is if you start asking people, what do you want in life? Then again, some people might shallowly say, oh, I want a good job. I want family, kids, da, da, da. But if you go on and poke them and say, but why do you want that? Why do you want a car? Why do you, why do you want whatever comes up, what is on your mind? Very at the end, people will say, I want to be healthy and happy. That's 100% of the world population. So I always say like the, the, um, the total addressable market from an investor's business side 
of what we're doing is literally 100% um, of, uh, of the world population. Uh, so that's one thing. And then if I may, may like, why did I start with Juberon? Like then particularly, and then maybe one of the few ones because we started like sort of, how do I say, we started to over thousands of years to tell us a story that aging makes is good because it makes you wise or whatever, yeah? Because we thought that it's inevitable. Um, and we sort of were soothing our mind by saying, look, but it has perks. No, I'm happy to be wiser, but why do I need to age for that? Like, I want to have the body of a 20 year old. I'm happy to have the experience of a 44 year old, but I want the body of a 20 year old. I want everything. So aging sucks. Yeah. And I'm the only one who says it that openly. I really, it really sucks. Yeah. So I was looking at it very early and it was like biotech as a whole over the last, it's really started like six, seven, eight years ago, just like it's starting to make these enormous exponential growth in what we can do. So there started to be chatter like, oh, this might be, we could cure aging. Uh, but when I looked, and we're talking now about 2018, when we started Rejuveron, when I looked around, like what is there, there was nothing. There were supplements, whatever, that's another topic, but there was nothing which was real deep science, which has the potential to really significantly, and we're talking, let's say the first step beyond 100 years to prolong healthy human lifespan. And in Germany, there's a saying, if you want to get it done properly, do it yourself, yeah? I was like, my clock is ticking. I know what I'm good in, yeah? Um, I want to do it. I met Matthias, like, yeah, let's do it together. Because I always say, and this is a good thing, both for our shareholders and humanity, I primarily do that for myself, yeah? And I really have a sense of urgency because every day I wake up and I'm a day older, yeah? But out of that motivation doing it for myself, I'm doing it for practically everybody else. Very good. Uh, Keith, let's come to you. Sure, and firstly, thank you for having me at this, which looks to be a promising uh, forthcoming excellent uh, panel here. So as in introduced, I'm Keith Kimito, president of the 501c3 organization, Lifespan.io, which raises funds and awareness for research aimed at extending healthy human lifespan. And additionally, I also spearhead R&D projects for Disney and have invented a number of, I uh, guess what you'd now call metaverse adjacent technologies that you might be using yourself. But back to aging, I've been interested in fighting age-related disease almost as long as I can remember. And it really became a singular focus for me after caring for my grandmother who had severe um, protracted Alzheimer's disease uh, until her death. And it became very clear to me at that point that there's no moral view of the world that could allow for this kind of suffering if it can be overcome. And back, well, but back when we started Lifespan.io in 2014, which feels like a million years ago, things were very different in terms of the public perception of aging research. And we took it as our explicit mission to address this by informing, engaging, and exciting the public regarding the, the feasibilities of this work and the positive uh, benefits its fruition can have on all of society. And our initial way of doing this back in the day was crowdfunding campaigns, essentially seeking to emulate the success of the early cancer research advocates when they were doing things like the Jimmy Fund, for example, if anybody remembers that. And not only doing this for the purposes of raising funds for early stage research, uh, which needed it, but also to start building an ecosystem of those interested in supporting this work who could then also become investors, activists, journalists, et cetera. And that is what happened. As most of you likely know, uh, we, we run a thriving news outlet at lifespan.io, uh, produce YouTube videos and documentary films engaged with by millions, catalyze investor deal flow uh, in promising projects with our longevity investor network, and also to help create other organizations that can do things that 501c3s can't, uh, such as the political lobbying work being done by our allied organization, the Alliance for Longevity uh, Initiatives, for example. So in some ways, uh, not to you know get too excited, but our initial mission has been you know somewhat fulfilled in terms of getting the word out. And now the question sort of becomes, how do we focus this further and take things to the next level and really uh, 
you know, to Christian's point to really get this every day faster because every day matters. Uh, someone dies every second, right? So one area that we believe uh, will help this, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit, is the emerging intersection between longevity and blockchain technology with DAOs like VitaDAO, which we can talk about, which also intersects with my work as an inventor. And this can not only help to accelerate fundraising into the field, but also fix systemic healthcare data issues and create new ways to rally large communities behind this incredibly important field of work. And germane to this subject here, I think on that last point, given the theme of today's conversation is, you know, how to find investors, I'd like to underline the often overlooked value of outreach and inspiring artistic projects like the video you showed earlier. Uh, in this endeavor. Uh, as one example, a few years ago, we worked to produce a series of videos on aging research with a very popular YouTube channel called Korskazak, which positively affected over 15 million people and contributed to a significant change in the public discourse. And I'm sure likely catalyzed tens of millions of dollars of investment into the field. And importantly, that endeavor only cost in the tens of thousands of dollars to produce and a few hours of my time to help write the scripts. So just like we need to focus on the core mechanisms of aging, so too will the field advance quickest by targeting and supporting force multiplying endeavors like this and, and systemic upgrades. And that's why, for example, at Lifespan.io, we're focusing on, uh, this year on doing more initiatives like that series with Course Kazak, with our very own uh, large scale YouTube channel, uh, Life Noggin, and uh, working also on a feature length film called The Last Generation to Die. Uh, and also building core infrastructure to hopefully enable decentralized clinical trials and aiming to launch a first example of this using non-pharmacological interventions for Alzheimer's disease that could hopefully get to everybody for free. So these are the kinds of endeavors where any level of success could catalyze a massive narrative shift in the field and amongst other things, uh, further validate the space and bring in a lot more investors. Uh, so if that sounds logical to you, you know, let's talk about it. And, you know, please help us everyone at lifespan.io. Shameless plug. That sounds excellent. And uh, Christian, I'm going to go straight to, now to, to Kevin, because Christian representing, if I may say, the conventional, the venture capital type approach, uh, Keith, the crowdfunding approach, Kevin Parrott, tell us about your approach. It's, I guess if you had to call it an approach, it's sort of like an open source approach um, where we can have people contribute and collaborate to actually create the solutions that we're actually interested in. Uh, I am a cancer survivor. Um, and while I was in the hospital with cancer, which is one age related disease, I realized the need, the driver of the market and the sense of urgency that Christian referred to. Uh, is very clear to anybody who has, you know, been, had a traumatic sort of medical experience. Um, and time becomes the only resource that means anything, um, frankly, at that point. So every day, actually, I now treat the most, uh, it's about minimizing time to the development of interventions as quickly as possible. Uh, for my parents, who the longevity space rarely talks about because we've already written them off, and uh, for myself, primarily, you know, I keep telling everyone I'm the most selfish person on the planet, but I want more life, you know, I want more life, I want more health. Um, and if and money is just a means to getting that. So when I think about making a profit, when I think about in companies uh, supporting research, it's always to the, to, to the uh, point of minimizing time to the development of interventions that I can access for myself. And I've been doing this for 20 years since before there was even an industry for people with money to get excited about. So um, I'm wearing a t-shirt from the uh, immense.org. Uh, shout out to Justin and BJ Klein and all the people who originally attracted me from cold Edmonton to get online with IRC chat groups to talk about philosophically, when would a person like to die? You know, because that's basically what you're asking people is at what stage of health would you be driven to consider suicide? And frankly, as long as you're healthy, to Christian's point, there is really nobody that would choose door number two. You know, everybody would probably still want to be exist. And um, but there is one thing aging has a tremendous uh, burden of psychological 
baggage to carry around with it. And trying to get people even thinking or hopeful that there's anything that can be done about aging has been a major, major problem. But now that that, that has actually shifted and changed, and that is what, is, you know, what Keith has contributed to with the messaging that SENS Research Foundation has managed to do, is that together as a group, as a movement, we have managed to shift the conversation to something where people with resources are actually interested in uh, developing these, these technologies. Um, but every time, so I have a for-profit entity called Open Cures, which is helping people manage their health, measure their health, and combine their data to help accelerate research. But um, uh, they are customers. Um, and how do we get the, your customer is your first investor. Uh, they are the people with the money in their wallet that are actually going to pay for a product or a service. And right at the moment, uh, investors are often healthy people who want to invest in companies simply for financial return. But I would beg the question, I think, who are the investors? Why are we as a movement, you know, together trying to work on this? I would propose that we're all about minimizing time to the development of interventions and that we're looking for mechanisms to accelerate that and uh, you know, attracting people who are interested and have financial motivations is, is it. But we really have to have our compass set properly together as a group. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen to share one image, but I would love to just leave people with as we get on and talk about how do we pump money into this system uh, using these various approaches because they're all legitimate. Um, is it possible for me to, to do that? Um, you can try. It may go. I, think I can. It looks like I can. It looks like I can. So I'm going to try. That. Okay, okay. I'm going to just do it. This, he's walking on a tightrope, ladies and gentlemen. But there you go. Walk us through it. Okay, good. Well, the, at least there's nothing uh, you know embarrassing uh, in this particular window. But basically, when I sat back in my uh, I'm finishing my PhD at the tender age of 53 in biomedical engineering. Uh, I was thinking, how can we speed things up? And then I had to take a step back and say, well, this is the health development technology, health technology development process that we need to speed up. It's not just a single company. It's, it's actually the whole system that generates new therapies. All of it needs to be sped up at the same time. And so you, and people are actually all applying interventions right now to themselves. And we need to get them to produce blood samples, assay those blood samples or other samples to produce data that then go to insights and then create the next interventions. So this cycle is to be coordinated by, it's an ecosystem. Um, currently it's a medical ecosystem, which is uh, directed at catastrophic care. And we need to try to move this into the preservation of health and the maintenance of health space. And in order to do that, this is going to take an awful lot of work and an awful lot of companies are going to be built and the synergies and the value and the financial proposition to people who are just solely interested in profit and financial profit is that if you can be part of this system, you've just created a multi-trillion dollar system that you can then benefit from. So I think everybody should, I would love everybody to step back, take a look at what is necessary to get these therapies in the shortest amount of time delivered to consumers and how can we bootstrap it together? And that is going to take collaboration, new tools, new models of interaction, new models of funding, uh, not just uh, actual work and the current status quo of siloing data is not going to work. So anyway, I'm going to stop with that now. That's, that's a really helpful slide to have seen. And uh, I want to come to you all and with a, really the elephant in the room here is that this area has an image problem. It has a lot of baggage. And you think of people in the past who have, and it's, you know, there's been an association with uh, billionaires, you know, wanting to live to uh, immortality. And actually, that's not what we're talking about. Living longer is a byproduct of living uh, healthily for longer and it's the health span that we are primarily invested in but christian how do you overcome this uh, image problem that this area has christian you're on mute 
I say, first of all, sometimes, okay, let's put aside if it's an image, if, if it is an image problem, sometimes these sort of what you refer to like billionaires wanting to live forever, sometimes, and I'm a big fan of that, is it's very good, this is what Elon Musk is doing with, oh, we're gonna go to Mars. That's a long, literally a long journey, physically, but also like till we get there. But he set off a very positive change of things because if you set the goal, you suddenly have to think, okay, if I wanna go to Mars, really like there is thousands of sub goals I need to reach before. By the way, side note, one of that is also like longevity health, like not, uh, not getting cancer, whatever, because flying so much too long, like would sort of at the moment you would arrive and if everything else would work out, you would have cancer. Yeah, so we have to solve cancer before going to Mars. Um, so, um, so what I want to say is like sometimes it's very important, I think, to put daring goals out there and then to say, well, and now let's go step by step that we know the direction. So I don't even think it is that wrong to say maybe someone. Yeah, and then we can be more optimistic, less optimistic, whatever, but somewhere we might be immortal in a, in a certain way. By the way, my personal feeling is, or not even feeling, my personal expectation is that already in my lifetime, so in, because I'm sort of in the middle, like most likely for many people, yeah, we are gonna live that long in a healthy way that somewhere we wanna die. Because I think philosophically, this finite and this sort of deep question is what comes next? Is sort of very um, human, yeah. But who says I can't do it for 150 years? Or some might want to try it for 300 years. So I want to be really actually a daring one, and then sort of say, okay, now let's go step by step, healthy, gradual uh, life uh, expectation. But uh, you're right, and this is why it was important what Keith was saying, yeah. Sort of, it's also this politically. Actually, it's even more than an image problem if I go to the daily pragmatic issues we're facing. And I wanted to mention it because he said it sort of en passant, yeah, he was like, we're doing, he said, we're doing political lobbying. So for all the ones who are in the call who might, might ask themselves why political lobbying is because aging is not even seen as a disease yet. We all start, this is what maybe you dialed in uh, uh, into this call, we start seeing it as a disease, yeah, but it's still not seen by the FDA as a disease. So when we do drug development at Rejuberon, um, we uh, we actually have to do workarounds, which by the way, from a financial perspective is very healthy because that means we have to set ourselves again, short-term provable goals, which we can show to the FDA, get approval, which is from a discipline financial point, extremely healthy. But like we all working together, the industry to sort of make the FDA acknowledge aging as a disease, which will make some trial design uh, way, uh, way easier. Um, so, but by the way, I think it's changing a lot. I think sort of when I started thinking about it 2016-ish, yeah, it was really fringe. Yeah? The same what Keith said, sort of this was like, but like, it's a little bit like one of my other favorite topics of mental health and psychedelics. Over the last three, four years, society is really catching up. And I would say we almost start to have a positive consensus that aging is a disease and we can cure it. And by the way, that is my biggest thing which makes me so optimistic is because we have one thing as humans we have as a track record is once we defined and accepted something to be a solvable problem, yeah, it really is. My sort of counter example is we shouldn't stay stuck in almost a religious view on the world of the past because what we did as humans because we saw people aging and dying over the last thousands of years since we we're there, we started spinning that story that aging is natural, aging is good, yeah, into our society, into everything, yeah, which is a little bit reminds me of when people said the plague was a punishment of God. And if you go back in history, there were people who at the time of the plague said, uh, it could be bad hygiene, it could be the rats, and they were burned because the others were saying, no, it's God. And you are not even allowed to think about why we have to suffer. Yeah. And at the moment, we're seeing that seismic shift positively of an enlightened society. We're like, wait a moment. We know what it, we know why it's happening. We start decoding aging that makes it a 
solve a problem and that's why we're going to solve it. By the way, side note, because since a long time nobody has mentioned it, I love Kurzgesagt, whoever, not just for aging, like it's like, it's one of the really, really cool uh, science channels. So I discovered it a year ago, so very late. So if, uh, uh, if uh, generally check out Kurzgesagt, it's really awesome. We've got some great comments in uh, Boris uh, uh, Georgievic. I hope I'm probably getting that horribly mangled. Uh, healthy aging, the technical term is oxymoron. <laughs> There's no such thing. And Kevin, uh, you're really into that. Uh, you'd agree with that. Well, totally. And, and, and Christian, the overlap in my brain and your brain is almost like is the Venn diagram is pretty, pretty sufficient. I mean, setting your compass, really, uh, from a first principles point of view, everybody should get on board that aging is a bad thing. And quit dressing it up and putting lipstick on it and pretending it's like something that's good. Unfortunately, because people are hopeless, you know, there's like Stockholm syndrome, they, they need to make aging a friend. And it's a, that is an aberrant, you know, that's a mental disorder. So, so when aging does have a problem, uh, or love the longevity field does have a problem it's the fact that people are insane when it comes to thinking about getting older and dying and they're not putting aging in its proper perspective which is as an enemy which we really all need to collaborate to to get rid of um so the first steps would be to get rid of putting healthy or graceful or any other you know softening adjective in front of that word aging so that it can be and quit, <laughs> quit equating aging with with uh just wisdom the falling apart you know i i don't mind getting older i don't mind getting wiser but i certainly am not interested in falling apart and i've been doing this for 20 years so as excited as everybody is at this point in time about this phase shift i have no faith that in my lifetime there were you know well, let's warp speed the, the, the heck out of this. I could use something in other, but let's apply the same type of sense of urgency, especially people with resources who actually want this. And um, we will be making an awful lot of money at the end of the day when we actually have more years. I spoke to a billionaire once and uh, he said, oh, well, if I could get another healthy year, I could make another hundred million dollars. I mean, that was one of the most intelligent things that I heard coming out of somebody of, of significant means. So again, time is the only thing that we're running out of. And I've been doing this for 20 years. So my sense of urgency is becoming rather acute. And um, so let's go, let's go for it. And let's find out what, how we can do this. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is that what has happened in this field is that you've set the ambition and actually people are beginning to catch up with that ambition and think that it's it is possible after all so uh, keith if this is uh, if people have put that idea of let's call that the uh, the immortal side which which spooks quite a lot of people they've put that aside do you think that federal governments and this is a question that's come in are ready to start putting their billions of dollars into this field and how does that in fact affect the other investment that's coming into this area yes I, i'll answer that question first and then i want to circle back on the public perception uh, after but to answer that question you know, I've been having a lot of conversations with people in various parts of the government, you know, Health and Human Services, FDA, NIH, NIA. And the general perception that I get is even though the system, in a sense, is a little bit calcified into this old model, the siloing disease focused, instead of looking at the, the root causes of aging, any individual person that I talk to is very optimistic that this waterfall is ready to flow. But if I'm being very transparent, the way that it comes across to me is almost like we want to change. We want to do decentralized clinical trials. We want to prioritize the root causes of aging, but we're kind of stuck in the system. But if somebody out there can do something that essentially embarrasses us, if we do a crowdsourced clinical trial for dementia that has any results, which is better than the 30 years of completely you know, unaffected, ineffective drug trials for 30 years. That would be such a shockwave to the system that would create 
uh, that activation energy to allow much more government funding to go into it. So I'm actually more optimistic than most that, you know, it's one of those, you have to build up the activation energy sort of thing, but then once the tide turns, I think it's gonna happen really fast. And keeping in, term, in, in with that kind of last point there, on the public perception, this is, you know, the main thing that, you know, the front line that I've chosen to fight on is exactly that, you know, uh, messaging to the public about why aging, working on aging is feasible and good and moral, right? And to bring back, you know, Chris Kazakt again, when we did those videos in 2017, I think, that was really a watershed moment, I think, for the field, but also for my own mind, where it wasn't just that 16 million people watched it and liked it. It was that the like to dislike ratio was like 99.99999 yes, which really sealed it in my mind that it's not that aging has itself a perception problem. It's that a lot of the advocates up until that time, there's a messaging problem. Right. And how do we have to, you know, we need to study the science of cognitive biases and not hit the backfire bias. I'll give one example here. There's a there's a, a bias called hyperbolic discounting, which means that you don't tend to rank the future as you know optimally as you should. And one way that I typically get around this is ask people three questions is number one, you know, would you like to be uh, would you like to live to be 150 years old? Most people, their knee jerk reaction, you know, even if I say assuming that you'd still be healthy and even if it's 120, you're still healthy, your friends are still healthy, et cetera. You know, they'll go, oh, no, no, no. Like 90 is a good age. That's enough. And I go, OK, forget about that question. Do you want to be alive tomorrow? Everyone says yes. And I say, do you suspect the answer to that question will change tomorrow? Assuming everyone's still healthy and they think about it and go, no. Tomorrow, I will still say I want to be alive the next day. Well, by mathematical induction, you answered the same question two different ways. Why? It's because in the second conception, you're now properly thinking about that person as if it's you, like an infinite tomorrow, not some different person 50 years from now, right? So that's just an example of just a slight narrative change. And one final point here is rather than trying to convince people to switch to your side. It's so much easier to convince people that they've been on your side all along and they just didn't know it. Because one of the critiques that people might have is, oh, I don't wanna be hooked up to a dialysis machine for 30 years. I don't wanna protract my period of morbidity, right? But then it's easy to convince them, say, you know that future that you're worried about? That's the thing that the current system maximizes. And the work that we're doing here is to work against that. We're on the same team. Absolutely. And we, we've got some uh, very good questions. We've, we've tackled one that from David Wood about uh, government uh, funding, but there is a huge potential longevity dividend. I mean, the governments all over the world are realizing that they cannot cope with uh, the funding required to keep everybody in uh, the kind of care that they need you know, as they develop diabetes, as they increasingly develop cardiovascular disease or heart failure. So this is becoming an increasingly important subject. And this work that all of you are doing is laying those foundations. And what I'm getting from all of you is that we are at this waterfall moment. What I want to come to is how do you, each of you decide on those companies or projects that you feel ought to be funded? Because each of you are funding in your, in your different ways. Uh, Christian, let's start with you. I mean, what do you look for? And, uh, and what are you looking for in terms of time span? Because although you say you're, you know, you're selfish about funding in that you, you know, you, you want to live healthily for, for far longer, actually, most people are looking for a return. Absolutely, like, and it goes hand in hand. By the way, I need to tell one anecdote because I just realized it, and I know I'm always <laughs> answering lower than I should, but like, because like, one I'm gonna thing, cut you off short if you do, Christian yeah, Angerman. Like one thing you're gonna like, you're gonna like, you're gonna really like. If you look behind me, uh, I'm a history geek. So that is a two thousand year old mosaic, um, and it's the story of Ganymede. Um, let's leave the backstory out because he had to sleep with somebody to become immortal. Yeah, but the point is, the point is that in, 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 in the ancient times, yeah, becoming immortal was a gift, was sort of just for the best and the most beautiful. So Gan Ganymede was seen 
always it was reportedly the most beautiful uh, person in ancient Greece in mythology, and then Zeus fell in love with him uh, and, and bestowed immortality on him. He's now a star and an immortal minor god. Yeah, and then just Christianity really messed it up because the, the Vatican was like, okay, if people would think they could live for long, then they wouldn't pay us because sort of we want to say, look, there is a date coming when you face God and you can pay us now to be fine. Yeah, so that whole thing messed it up. But like originally, the idea of immortality was a very good one. And we have to go back to that. But just now it's not just for the elite. It's it's going to be for anybody, but that shows like how long humans have have thought about uh, about that. Um, the second hey, one. Well, I'm going to bring you to the point, Christian. What, right, the second what one is, but I want to use it because I like the question of that guy of uh, what is his name, David. Yeah, because he asked by the Tame trial, which is a very famous trial, which is uh, which is about metformin, why it's not going forward. It's the funding because there is no patent on metformin, so nobody's paying it. Yeah, so. It goes hand in hand in generally biotech, you need patents, yeah, that allows you to invest. Yeah, the return is enormous if you're successful. Yeah. If we just have a drug, yeah, one, and rejuveron has plenty of them in development, which by the way, not talking about immortality now, gives us two more health. By the way, I agree with healthy aging, but healthier aging, yeah. That is gonna be a double-digit billion truck. There was a, on Twitter some days ago, somebody with big following was asking if you were you can pick, do you want to be 80 with 500 billion or whatever 100 million, or do you want to be 20 and broke? Literally everybody said I want to be 20 and broke, which by the way, in Keith's way to be, to turn it around, is like that means at a certain age, every person is willing to give all of their money, 100 percent to buy some more years in a healthier state. That makes, and that is by the way, so frustrating in the moment because biotech, at least on the stock market, and it's a moment has a, has a, has a very weak moment. And I don't understand it, meaning it's more like momentum, whatever, because like, but I think it's one of the biggest investment opportunities of all time, because you produce something which literally you own because you have the patents, and everybody will, at the end, give you all their money yeah, for your product. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Christian, I'm going to halt you in your <laughs> and say, because you still haven't answered my question here, which is, what are you looking for in companies that come along? So how do I get because, because some of them are because some of them are going to uh, fail, of, of course, that's part of that's part of, of being an investor. But what do you look for? that gives a greater chance, do you think? Yeah. So, so, I, mean, I have to correct the question because I don't look for companies. I have a company, Rejuveron, yeah? So what, how, how did I build Rejuveron? Like Rejuveron is a platform company, meaning mm -hmm. we're tackling several, and the ultimate goal is to tackle all of these famous nine hallmarks of aging, which side note, very proud of that, this term nine hallmarks of aging has been developed by Professor Manuel Serrano, who is a colleague in Rejuveron. Yeah, so practically the whole industry is a little bit based on, on his matrix, what aging is. Yeah, and Rejuveron wants to develop various drugs yeah, uh, against these nine hallmarks of aging, which means in Rejuveron, we have a diversification yeah, because we have several and growing a uh, growing pipeline of drug development programs. That's the first, because indeed biotech is risky. You never know from the beginning if it really works out. Yeah, so you wanna, uh, you wanna be diversified, which we are within Rejuveron already. Second, a big shout out to, unfortunately has the, a minor operation with his foot. Yeah, he did a little bit too much of crazy sport, Matthias. Yeah, a big shout out to Matthias. Why did I found a Rejuveron with Matthias together? Because the most important thing in great scientists, which is rare, is the urge to develop a project and a product and not just do great science. So and Matthias is a great scientist, but he has sort of the commercial understanding and the sense of urgency to say, look, I want to come to a single one and hopefully more approved medical drugs as quick as possible, which with as little money as possible, which sounds normal. But trust me, I'm investing in biotech since a long time. Sometimes scientists are like, you know what? I want to do another trial and another trial because I want to do trials and actually not get a product approved. Yeah. 
So and Matthias is this great combination of a very good scientist, and this is how we, this is the DNA for the whole company. Let's be efficient with our money, yeah, and let's get drugs to approval through the various steps as quickly as possible. So okay. that's what I'm looking for. Christian and Aaron King, thank you for your enthusiasm and encouragement. You still haven't answered the question. It's a platform, Rejuveron is a platform, but how do you assess the things that you that come to that platform that you want to invest in? I mean, you're saying that you're looking at one- well, You mean, you guys, so, okay. But that is like, I mean, that's now a science question. That's Matthias, you can't, there is no, there is no formula I can present. I mean, that's a science question. So you look at the compound, the idea, because we start partly very early. Actually, Rejuveron partly starts with a mechanism of action or an idea, and then you find the compound. Yeah? So the assessment is we, we are tech driven, but there is a human component where you're like, you, you have, yeah, uh, this is holistic. Okay. holistic like, yeah. So it's like, but it, this is like sort of for the good, a good commercial scientist is good at. Okay, finally, we got there. Thank you. Uh, Keith, Keith Camito, how do you go about assessing the kind of uh, developments or trials or whatever that, because presumably there are an awful lot, what makes you decide which ones to invest in? Right. So uh, kind of maybe from my own like computer science mind, you know, I, I like to try to look at the entire field, almost like a military commander and see, you know, which particular projects are tactically useful for one reason or another or have a, some sort of unique value add to the whole ecosystem. Right. So in terms of, say, crowdfunding, what we what we do on Lifespan.io, you know, we would rank projects in the way that you would naturally assume, you know, is the team credible? Do we think they can get the job done, right? But then of course, one of them that would be very relevant is how core to the aging process is it? Is it some downstream cancer therapy or is it genetic instability? You know, we would favor genetic instability because it's something more systemic, right? And then vis-a-vis -vis the earlier conversation, one of the things that I also look for is these other potential public perception or political, um, you know, TAME is a good example here. You know, some of us might, you know, uh, you know, not think that maybe metformin is going to give you 30 years of, of lifespan. It, it might, might not be the best, but it, it's in this unique, you know, policy related tactical point. So that would be one that I would think is like, we should try to come together uh, and get that funded. Right. And, you know, so I, I think that's sort of the main kind of rubric. Also, this isn't just research itself, but this is why I work with VitaDAO and other organizations and DAOs to try to see what systemic factors are holding back all research, including aging research that we might be able to improve. As one example, if you've ever heard any of my previous talks, you'll know that um, some of the technologies that I've invented are, are around like body, face, voice, those kind of technologies. And to me, it's a real drop the ball that all clinical trials aren't mandatorily required to at least collect face and voice data longitudinally, because that could be a good aggregate biomarker for age that would flag to the researcher something interesting is going on. Uh, and that's low hanging fruit, could be free. So at, for example, any project that might be something that could demonstrate that in such a way to create that positive embarrassment that I mentioned earlier, those kind of projects that can catalyze a change in the actual system that affects everything. That's what I look for personally. For the public perception and the, the, the citizen science approach, which is actually enormously powerful. Kevin, where do you uh, decide what to, to do? I mean, how important is uh, the time span? Because, you know, some things, you know, genomic instability, for instance, as uh, Keith says, are really long term. And you're talking perhaps maybe 20 years, but are you looking for things that have a, you know, the low hanging fruit? So when I, yeah, so I've been doing this again for two decades and looked at research and I looked at individual things are unlikely to solve aging or even come close to solving aging uh, individually. The reprogramming stuff that's becoming, or might have a, a, a pretty huge impact. I'm, I'm hopeful of that. But I'm more concerned with the fact that it takes so long and so much money to develop even just a single particular application or intervention. And we need to actually fix the system so that we can develop and test 
hundreds of thousands of potentially millions of interventions all in parallel instead of this you know system the investment of the uh, so i look at the health technology development system the graphic that i had originally shown and i look are there companies that are fulfilling some aspect or some key function of that are there look what is the logistics of even getting bio like clinical trials working with live humans is a lot more difficult than working with mice so when you need to test interventions in a human uh, context it's that's where everything starts to get really expensive and take an incredibly long period of time because of the regulations etc why don't we all focus on creating an in silico model of human health that we can test millions of different interventions on at the same time we can do this in a computer and this is uh, what keith does an awful lot of this sort of simulation type of thing so we need to focus on how do we accelerate everything. So I look at different companies that are collecting data, that are you know, capable of using humans as a human vivarium, clinical trials, all different aspects of, of the uh, current system, which take an awful long time and are very expensive. We need to remove the friction from that system as much as possible. And then at the end of the day, <clears throat> investors will be getting uh, not only the interventions that actually are they're looking for, hopefully, but also the getting the satisfaction of selling things to customers who are paying for them. So key investment is looking at where are the gaps in the health technology development cycle, find companies that are using new uh, technologies to remove the friction in those, looking at these barriers and funding them and getting them to work together in an ecosystem again it's this ecosystem thing we, we will not get any further very much faster if we do not uh provide systems where people can share data talk to each other you know and uh with it's the old system is just can't can't uh, function and can't produce what we want it to in speed uh that we need it uh, so let's look at retooling everything. Let's find the companies with the infrastructure, the computing, the analytics. Everything needs to be looked at. Everything should be on the table. Christian's platform idea is exactly what, what we need. To do. So that's fascinating. So uh, really investors should be thinking far more widely than just, if I like, if, if, say like this, science companies. They should be thinking of, about, you know, some of the enablers in the system. And Keith, to your point, uh, the perception point is that you also need to lobby government to allow the regulations to be altered because many of the regulations that are in place at the moment, and we're going to discuss this in our third session, so come to the, listen to the third session, but the, the, some of the regulations that are in place are not appropriate to aging research and you know what are the proxies in trials for instance that you could use instead of just uh, death which might be years ahead and really takes you know make trials impossible keith yeah absolutely uh well key to that point is obviously uh standardization of of biomarkers right because that is exactly the kind of thing that can give you a signal uh you know for example that would have been another point of intersect that that relates to policy is of course what's you know elephant in the room the pandemic uh, the pandemic is obviously tragic and horrible, but I think it has made the case very clear to people in government that if we had biomarkers that could show that uh, some kind of, you know, something like vitamin C or something like that is improving immune system function, and we can learn that very quickly, that is something that would have allowed us to react much more quickly in a situation like this. So I, I think the, the broader subject of biomarkers is very, you know, it's one of these key uh, technologies as part of the stack that we really need to improve. And I, I'm very much focused on that myself. And one other aspect of what you were saying there in terms of what to fund and, and how it relates to the broader ecosystem, you know, um, I would imagine that it would be very valuable for significant investors to also be not just looking at each investment play in isolation, but how they all kind of potentially relate to each other. As an example, you know, something that would actually rejuvenate the skin, you know, maybe that isn't going to make you live much longer, but that would catalyze such a, you know, the second your neighbor is taking something that's making them look 10 years younger and it's 
actually making their skin younger? Like, does anybody honestly believe people will not want to buy that and that will not catalyze a massive perception change? So like, that's a good, you know, if you have that technology, that's one that you should invest in because then if that its success will help all of your other investments, right? Fabulous. We, it's astonishingly, we've already come to the end of our time. Um, and, but Christian, I'm going to give you the final word. That's always a dangerous thing to do, but I know that you've only got two minutes. So Christian, why should people invest in this area? Because it's the right thing to do for themselves and for their money. That was short, right? That was, that was, that was, that was astonishing. <laughs> Uh, I, I chalk that up as a great success of my interviewing career, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you to Kevin. Thank you to Keith. And uh, Christian, thank you so much. Now, we're going to reconvene in 10 minutes time. Uh, so whatever time zone you're in, it'll be 10 minutes after the hour that we will rejoin. And the next session is spectacular. It brings together three outstanding scientists to talk about where the big gains are for the future. Back soon. Bye for now. Bye bye.
Well, welcome back, everybody. And have we got a session for you? We started in fine form, lots of interesting discussion there. But now we're coming to three outstanding scientists to talk about the bold ambitions. What's the status quo of the longevity field? Where are we going? Do our scientists agree that this is a waterfall moment in this field of research? And to answer that question and many more, we hope, and remember you can put your questions in the question box and we'll come to them as we go through. Let me introduce these three outstanding scientists. Uh, so uh, first up, Vadim Gladyshev. Uh, Vadim is a professor of Harvard. He's specialized in redox biology, but he's published on a whole range of topics, particularly molecular clocks to measure aging rates. And he's well known for characterizing the human selenoproteum, which I hope he might explain to you. Then uh, we have Matt Kabelin. Uh, Matt is a professor in pathology at the University of Seattle. Uh, he has published a huge amount of publications in this field, uh, all sorts of different aspects. And one of the things that he's best known for is his work on rapamycin. Rapamycin is an immunosuppressive, but it's been used extensively in trials in longevity. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, Pedro, but more properly, Joao de Magalas. I, I've got that horribly wrong, Pedro. I've mangled your name. Oh, it's, it's okay. Uh, uh, Pedro is studying aging at the University of Birmingham, and he runs multiple databases on aging and on interventions associated with extension of lifespan. He's also CSO of Youth Biotherapeutics, so could look at this field from both the investor point of view as well as the science point of view. So uh, let's start with Vadim. Yeah, thank you, Vivian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we start. Uh, should I just say anything I'd like to, or you will ask some questions? <laughs> it's, well, just just give us your pitch for the moment on where you think uh, this field is, just very briefly. Okay, so um, we are in a very exciting moment, I think, uh, in the field uh, because of the, so many changes recently. Um, uh, in time, uh, research-wise, and I think this session is more on the fundamental side of, of aging and uh, kind of conceptual kind of thinking in the field. So I, I, I still think we are quite far from from the goal that that that, that could be achievable. Uh, there are many like very fundamental questions that have not been answered yet. And just to start, uh, we don't agree on the definition of aging. So we think about the aging process in very different ways. Even um, even the top experts in the field, I, I uh, you know, we might might discuss this in this panel or not. I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm sure even within this panel there would be a difference of opinion. And so, because some people think uh, of, of aging as uh, increased uh, chance of dying is age. So most of the evolutionary kind of thinking and evolutionary models are based on on this concept. And some people think that. Uh, uh, aging is the accumulation of damage, or well, for example, increase in the uh, you know in the biological age as measured by epigenetic clock. Or some people think there is no such thing as aging, and so there, there, there is a, a huge difference of opinion. And so we need to figure out uh, what exactly we're studying. And so this is needed in order for us to understand who is our enemy. So if we want to uh, target something, we really need to understand that process. And and currently there is there is no understanding. The, the one caveat in the field is that uh, on the surface, it seems it's very simple. We, we all see deterioration with age. And uh, in fact, in the, in the second uh, half of our lives, there's everything goes downhill. So function is decreased, fitness is decreased, biological age is increased, chance of dying is increased, and so on. But, uh, you know, there must be a, a major feature that is our, uh, that should be our target. It's not everything that, that the, the, these features that I described that characterize uh, aging. So we need to focus on that. We need to understand, we need to quantify it and develop methods to target this specific process. And this also applies uh, when we discuss rejuvenation, because there are now many examples of rejuvenation. 
But what does it mean to reach Vinate? When we go from the in the direction from the young to old and from the old to young, it may may not be the same direction. If we apply the clocks, uh, like epigenetic clocks, do they work in the both directions? Actually, we are not we are not sure. So there are many many very fundamental questions that that. So that's why I am a, a big advocate for more fundamental research in the field. And just explain to people what you mean by epigenetic clocks for the for the for the non scientists. And I know that you've published some very important papers on this in this last sure. year. Sure. Uh, in my mind, there has been a revolution in the field where uh, uh, new biomarkers uh, that quantify the aging process have been developed. It was started by Steve Horvath about ten years ago, and uh, you know even though these tools are imperfect, it needs need obviously be improved and. Uh, uh, and defined uh, and, and developed to various manifestations, uh, it's clearly a, a, a big step forward in, in the field because for the first time we are able to quantify the aging process. So, uh, and uh, this is a, this is seen in the you know uh, exponential increase in, in the publication in, in the influx of talent that that work in this field. So this is very exciting to me. Thank you. Uh, let's move on now to uh, Matt. Uh, Matt, hello. Hello. Thank, thank you. So, and where, I want to thank the organizers. Where are we, where are we in the field at the moment? <laughs> yeah. So first, I want to thank the organizers for uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here. And I also want to say that I see a, a comment from Jed Lai in the uh, the chat that I agree with, which would be to stick uh, Vadim, Pedro, and myself in a room and give us five million five billion dollars to uh, solve this problem. I think that's a great path forward. Um, so, so I want to start, I, I agree completely with something that Vadim said, which is that I think it's, um, it's really important that we take a step back and, and talk about how we're defining aging, because in my view, I think a lot of the arguments and the silly debates that people get into in this field often come down to different definitions of what we mean by aging. And actually, I think the panel before this is a really good example of Diff, maybe different meanings in in what we call aging, and I, you know, I agree with much of what was said in that panel. But you know, the the take home was aging is terrible. Aging is a disease. We have to fix aging. If you go to a geriatrics group or a group of social scientists and you say that, they're going to shut you down or they're going to get really upset. And I think so. I think we need to we need to be a little bit more clear about about what we mean. And so maybe one place to start is I think we can all agree on what chronological aging means, right? That's just the, the passage of time since birth. What most of us are talking about is biological aging, um, which is you know related to chronological aging. But even there, we have somewhat different definitions within this field. And I, I'm honestly still working on kind of my own personal definition. But the way I think about it is biological aging, you know, are the biological changes that occur over chronological time and create a different physiological state in an aged individual compared to a young individual. And one of the things we know is that that physiological state is at, at a minimum permissive for most of the functional declines and diseases of old, old age that, that lead to this idea that aging is terrible, aging is a disease, aging is something that we have to fix. And so I kind of think of it as that collection of, of biological changes. And these would include the well-known hallmarks and, and pillars of aging um, that came up in, in the last session. Um, I think there are a couple of important things about that definition to consider. One is that these biological changes are, are largely, but not completely shared across different animals and different species. And that's been really important for the field because it's allowed us to, to study biological aging in the laboratory and identify mechanisms and identify potential therapeutics. Another important thing to consider is, is biological aging happens at different rates. And you can see that easily by looking across different animals. I really like the comparison of dogs to people because we're all kind of familiar with the idea that one human year is about seven dog years. That's just another way of saying dogs age biologically about seven times faster than people do. And I think that's a really useful uh, way to illustrate the concept to the general public or to, to people who haven't really thought about biological aging, but also within a species, within humans, different individuals, we believe, are aging biologically at different rates. And we potentially can measure that. That's where this idea of the clocks come in and, and trying to, to, to measure the rate of biological aging. But I think it's also important to appreciate everybody's biological aging trajectory is a little bit different, right? It's not happening exactly the same way 
in every person. And that kind of brings me to a, another point that I think is important, which is we really need to be careful not to fool ourselves into thinking we figured it out. We've learned a lot about the biological aging process, but there's a lot that we still don't understand. And, and one, of, one of the things I see, which I think is problematic is too often people in this field tend to pick a specific part of biological aging and call that biological aging. And I think the epigenetic clocks that Vadim referred to are a really good example of this. People use those clocks as measures of biological aging. No, they measure a tiny little part of biological aging. And, and so I, I'll just say epigenetic aging is not biological aging, full stop. Nothing else needs to be said about that. Um, so the last point that I'll make is I, I just want to say one of the one of the the prompts was you know should we be optimistic? I'm really optimistic about where the field is, and I feel um, very fortunate to have been in the field um, for a little bit more than 20 years now. So I started studying aging when I was a graduate student back in the late um, 1990s, and uh, I feel fortunate to have been in the field during this time because I've seen a couple of um, pretty big what I would call paradigm shifts in the field in that in that time frame. Um, you know, it started before I started graduate school, but it was right around that time where I think the field shifted from kind of phenomenological, let's just catalog changes that happen as animals get older to really mechanistic studies. And 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 in some sense, that was due to the 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 use of invertebrate models, yeast, C. elegans, fruit flies. Tom Johnson, but really Cynthia Kenyon, Gary Ruvkin, Linda Partridge, and to some extent, Lenny Garenti, my PhD thesis mentor, brought in these model organisms where you could do very mechanistic studies. You could do unbiased genome screens. You could use biochemistry and molecular biology to, to really get at mechanisms. And that was really important because it gave initial credibility to the field, I think, among the broader scientific community. So I feel really fortunate to have come in when that was sort of happening. And then I think over the last decade, there's been another shift towards what I call translational geroscience and people really feeling like we've learned enough about the biology to actually start to target that biology in, in meaningful ways therapeutically and test some of these things in the clinic. And that was a theme I think that you know we saw in the first session. And, and I'm very optimistic that, um, you know, that that will be successful and that we'll see big advances uh, in translational geroscience and, and clinical application. And so I'll, now I'll really just finish and say, but I think we want to be careful not to get too, uh, too narrow, right? I feel like a lot of the strategies that people are taking moving into the clinic are, are all focused on a relatively small number of, of targets or these hallmarks. And, and, and I just want to caution the field against looking under the lamppost and again, thinking that we, we know it all and missing out on the sort of innovative new ideas, the things that we don't know yet. So I, I would like to see us broaden out a little bit more um, and, uh, and, and not get too focused on, on a few things. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, looking forward to hear what Pedro has to say. He can, he'll probably disagree with about half of what I said. So <laughs> Matt, that was great. And uh, I'm fascinated, there was a paper come out recently showing that people who had severe COVID have aged about a decade. Uh, so, you know, that, yeah. that. So I think that makes some sense, right? And I, I think, you know, it's clear that it's clear. So, first of all, it's clear that biological, I would say it's clear that biological age is one of the greatest risk factors for severe outcomes from COVID. But we also know that um, hyperactivation of the immune system, chronic inflammation is a, a key driver of, of at least the functional declines that go along with biological aging. So, it makes a lot of sense that that sort of immune hyperactivation and immune exhaustion would lead to acceleration of the, the phenotypes of, of old age. So yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it doesn't surprise me that that, that that seems to be the case. That, that, um, and I would also say that I think long COVID is a really interesting place to look. So for, for those of you who are in the sort of longevity biotech space, long COVID is actually a really interesting patient population to consider for some of the interventions that you're studying. Fascinating. Uh, Pedro, is that uh, an opportunity to start in yet another cohort? <laughs> uh, yes. Hi. So, so for, well, let me start by thanking this. It's, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here. Thank you for organizing this, uh, this symposium. Um, so just give us your take. Where do you think we are now? I mean, is, 
you uh, is our perception that we're at a waterfall moment that we've really made some big advances that there's some serious science lining up in this area is that a correct one and what do you see as the state of the nation as it were yeah so so i mean i i would agree with matt i i, I don't disagree with half of what he says i generally only disagree with 49 percent of what he says so so and i, I would agree with this with him on this in in the sense and in the past 20 years there's been a lot of progress really there's been um, but particularly at uh, uh, model organisms, we've had this tremendous progress in being able to manipulate aging in, in model systems at the genetic level. We've known of thousands of genes that, you know, if you tweak them in model systems, including in mice, uh, you can slow aging, you can extend lifespan, you can accelerate aging as well. Um, you know of drugs, you know of, of compounds that can um, slow down aging, extend lifespan. So, so really, in, from that perspective, from the science perspective, and thank to these pioneers that Matt mentioned, that that there really has been a huge um, advance in the field, and I think that that's one of the the reasons why the field it's 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 grown a lot, um, is is the science behind it. The science has advanced, at least in model systems. Um, I guess the the other reason is as as I think I, I think it was Christian who mentioned is that you know people grow older and they they and and the population is is growing older so uh, and, and that that will continue in the future so uh, so we have no other way except to tackle aging and if we could do it if we could slow down aging even if just a little bit if we could slow down human aging like we can in model systems then this would have massive um, health, medical, social, and, and economic impact. Um, so from um, an investors from a financial perspective it also makes sense um, to invest in this field. And then from a personal perspective, it also makes sense uh, because aging, you know, it, it predisposes to all of these diseases. And so so if we could tackle it, it would have tremendous uh, health benefits. Um, so, so from that perspective, I, I do think there's been a tremendous progress in the field. And it's, it's fantastic to see how the field has grown in uh, in the past uh, 20 years. I think that's, that's really fascinating. Um, so on the one hand, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic because of all this progress in preclinical models, in model systems, all of this investment, all this growth in the field. Um, but I, I guess as both Vadim and, and Matt mentioned, there's still some issues, there, there are still some limitations. I mean, uh, the big challenge still is to translate what we're discovering in model systems into humans, uh, which we haven't done yet. I mean, there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of excitement, there's um, some clinical trials, but we still don't have a success story. We still don't have you know, one drug or one therapy that works in humans that, that uh, slow zone aging. We, we still don't have that yet, although we have candidates. Um, so we still need a, this, this big, and it's a big challenge still, uh, not just in aging, but in other medical fields as well. Um, and then I would say that the other limitation, which again, both Vadim and, and Matt alluded to, is that we still don't truly really know why human beings age. We have a lot of theories. We have, you know, we have these hallmarks of aging, but they could or could not be correct. They, they could be completely wrong. Maybe, as Matt mentioned, maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Maybe there's something else out there that we're missing. That is a possibility we need to to accept. Uh, and from that perspective, I, I completely agree with Matt that actually um, the field, in a sense, is being a bit, perhaps a bit too narrow, focusing on a relatively small number of pathways. You know, epigenetic rep uh, reprogramming, senescence. So that there's a few pathways or a few processes uh, that, that there's a focus on, but perhaps we should be a little broader, a bit more creative. Um, in particular, if we, if we keep in mind that we still don't understand the mechanisms driving human aging, maybe there's something else out there that we have, we've missed so far. That's, that's not impossible. Um, and so I, I would, and if we can understand the mechanisms of aging, then that this would revolutionize our ability to develop interventions, right? If there's something else we're missing. So, so we still have some, some hurdles, but overall, mystic that of all of the successes in animal models, that something, or at least some of them, um, some drug, for example, uh, will pan out in human beings. Thank you, uh, Pedro. Uh, uh, let me turn to the whole panel now. And uh, you've all suggested that there are big gaps. Um, and Pedro has outlined some. Uh, Matt, where do you think the gaps are at the moment? So I, I think there are, I mean, obviously there are, there are gaps. I, I wanna just 
comment on one thing Pedro said that I don't completely agree with, which is that I think there's zero chance in my view that we are completely wrong about human aging, right? I mean, I think it's clear that many of the mechanisms of biological aging that lead to functional declines in disease in mice also lead to functional declines in disease in people. So, I, so I, I, I think there's no chance in my view, at least that we're completely wrong. I absolutely believe that there are aspects of human aging that you can't study in a mouse, maybe you can't study in a dog that might be unique to people and that that the, and that is a gap. Um, honestly, from my perspective, I don't spend myself a lot of time worrying about that. I'll let other people deal with that because it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to study the aspects of aging that are unique to people because people live so long, right? So I think that there are strategies you can take, but they're never going to be the clean mechanistic kinds of studies that we can do in worms and, and mice and, and companion animals where aging happens much more rapidly. So my perspective has always been to really focus on the things that I think we have a chance of understanding, you know, in a in in my career, um, and I just think it's really hard to 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 do those sorts of mechanistic studies that are aspects of aging that are unique to humans. But I am personally convinced that we can have big impacts on health span, hopefully lifespan, but certainly health span in people from what we can learn in in animal models. Vadim Gladyshev, uh, what's your take on this? Where are the gaps? Do you think? Okay, so my, think, my thinking is that the major gap, as I already mentioned uh, in my introductory statement, uh, is that we need to better understand the nature of aging. I, uh, I agree with what just Matt said, uh, but not fully really. Uh, I think that fundamentally aging is the same in, uh, in model organisms and human. There, there is no such thing as human-specific aging. There is a human-specific biology, but fundamentally aging is the same. So and in, in my mind, aging comes from every aspect of biology. It's a kind of a byproduct of biology or consequence of biology. We have our genes, we have our biology or metabolism. And while uh, you know, it, it works, it also produces damage. And that damage is uh, ultimately the aging process. So, so we have various biology and therefore, of course, uh, various manifestations of aging are slightly different, but fundamentally aging is, is the same in my mind. So this is one aspect, and I think it's very difficult to study because it's a systemic process. It's not a single gene or a single compartment or a single tissue kind of process. And as biologists, we think in a very reductionist way. We want to, to, to identify a particular process and study it, like you know, a, a particular network of genes, or, or maybe even single gene, or maybe even some, some gene mutants, or some single gene knockout, and so on. And kind of through this, explain a big picture. And in many aspects of biology, it works. But in the aging, it does not. Because it's a systemic process. It comes from everywhere. There are too many processes. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to design experiments to target it and quantify. In my mind, uh, the new generation of biomarkers of aging begin to address that. So these are the first integrative biomarkers of aging. So oh, I, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's epigenetic. So forget that it's epigenetic, it's integrative. Yeah, and of course, epigenetic aging is, does not equal biological age. That's obvious. I don't think anybody would make a statement like this. But it's a systemic process, and we need to integrate various processes into you know, a relatively simple to use set of biomarkers that is quantitative enough to test interventions and quantify progression through aging, quantify progression or from, from an older state to a younger in rejuvenation. Until recently, it has not been possible. Now it begins to be possible, although we are not there yet, because the currently epigenetic clocks, they are, we don't know exactly what they measure. Yeah, so they presumably measure many aspects of aging. So for example, some changes which are truly damaging, deleterious changes. And there are some changes which are simply neutral, just that they happen to be with no functional consequences, as well as changes which are response to this damage. So, and it's all these kind of changes that characterize the aging process. They are a part of the epigenetic clocks. And, and, and I would say epigenetic, but of course, uh, again, so nothing special about epigenetics. Could be gene expression clocks. There could be some other omics class, but the important thing is integrate. So this is another kind of gap in my mind, biomarkers. The first generation is available. It needs to be improved. It's a big step forward, but we're still far from, uh, from where we are. I also think we need some good example in human biology. So 
what I mean by this is that if we would have success stories, some kind of intervention that would be shown to extend human lifespan, it would be great because it would bring even more funding, even more talent. I mean, we are lucky that, especially recently in the last couple of years, there's a huge influx of talent, huge influx of resources in the field. This is great. I think it would basically unavoidably lead, lead to accelerated um, advances in the field. So those things, I think, the, the kind of the major directions. Um, interesting, in the first session, we uh, heard from uh, Kevin Parrott of the idea of creating an in silico model of human biology that could accelerate the testing of new treatments. Um, and David Wood is, the question has come in, by the way, if you have a question, please do put it in the chat. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would maybe just add one more, more statement, uh, because I... Uh, I, I just not, I think another kind of major direction is rejuvenation. So until recently, we were not uh, even not, not possible to conceive that we could go from the older state to a young state. But now we have a few examples. This is really, really exciting. And of course, there is one aspect is uh, epigenetic reprogramming, but this is just only one. Uh, in general, can we go from an older state to a younger state, for example, in a cell? or in a tissue or in an organism. And so if we are able to rejuvenate, let's say a tissue, what is the biological age of that organism when one tissue is rejuvenated, but all other tissues are not? So all these questions, really fundamental questions, just are beginning to be addressed in the field. It's very exciting. Uh, what about that idea though of uh, in silico uh, model of human biology? Is that yes. a possibility? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I, 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 it's, it's a great idea. I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we are still far from understanding human biology or, or biology of any organism. Because if you look at the genome, we don't know the function of about half of the genes. So we have no idea what they do. So, and it, therefore it's very difficult to, to kind of divide uh, the current state of science to develop an in silica model. Even if we would know the functions of the genes, we would still not know how they all interact. So we know a lot of biology, but we still know very little to, to model in my mind. But it's a good direction that we need to make progress in this, of course. Interesting yeah. question for you, um, Pedro. Uh, this comes from David Wood. What might be examples of possible additional types of influence on low level aging damage that we don't yet have any good idea about? A new insight from evolutionary thinking, perhaps. So I would start by saying, well, maybe aging is not damage, depending on how you define damage. And I, might, I mean, me and Fatim, we may disagree on it. Um, so, so, so for example, I, I think, um, you know, normal wild type gene activity. Um, so we know, for example, from invertebrate models that can, um, let's call it modulate aging. Um, because if you knock out some genes, you extend lifespan. So, and, and, and whether that's damage or not, I think it's, it depends on how you define damage. So to me, that's one interesting question, for example, um, in the field, which is that we have this big focus on damage, typically chemical damage, um, you know, DNA damage, oxidative damage, not exclusively, or damage to the telomeres or epigenetic damage, but it's typically chemical damage, not exclusively. Um, but I actually think we should look at other uh, potential mechanisms, including those uh, genetically um, encoded in the genome as part of normal processes that as part of normal wild type processes then may trigger uh, pathologies later in life. So that, that's, that's uh, you know, that would be one example. Um, the problem, and this is something that Vadim touched upon, is that biology, well, human biology in particular, or, or mammalian biology is really, really complicated. We don't really understand. I mean, we don't understand what probably half the genes in the genome do. Um, and, and that is a big problem. We don't, our capacity to understand complex biological uh, processes um, is, is very limited. Um, uh, I mean, not just in aging, but in other parts of human biology. So, so that really is the, the, the major problem we have. So when you think about, okay, maybe there are some genetic programs that, that contribute to aging, well, we don't understand those. Um, and so our 
uh, conceptual uh, understanding is limited uh, because of our, I would say, technical uh, ability um, or analytical um, limitations as well. And that is a, a big problem. I, I mean, our lab, we, I mean, we do a lot of computational analysis and we do machine learning, we do predictions, and it works for simple things, for example. We can predict if a gene is associated or not with, with aging, for example, with some some well some some, some error margins, of course. Um, but to develop an in silico model, I mean I think that would be fantastic. I would love to do that, but um, I don't think that would be possible at this stage, even with all of the resources um, uh, in the world put together because our knowledge it's just not at that point as as, as Vadim has pointed out. Um, so that is that that's one of the limitations we have is that biology is complicated and when you look at other fields um you know they, they also start, i mean alzheimer's disease i would say uh which you could argue it's one facet of aging it's specific age-related disease um billions of dollars of funding and it's not well understood i mean there's still debate about what how it happens or what's its triggers um just to give one example so so that is that that's the the big problem we have still um is that you know the complexity of biology is still, uh, I, I would say, still overwhelming for for our uh, capacity to develop computational models and to fully understand or or, or even um, develop a greater conceptual understanding of aging. But what we've seen in other fields, I mean, I'm thinking of genomics in particular, where actually it wasn't that the science had advanced. It was the fact that sequencing and the high speed computing that made analysis possible were the things that revolutionized the study of genomics. Is there a similar thing? I mean, maybe it's this in silico uh, modeling, but you know, is there something like that in the aging field that you think might uh, change the field rapidly? Where it's a technological advance, because that's so often you see in science, uh -huh. is that you know suddenly advances come because there's been a technological advance in another field completely that then allows research to continue in a way uh -huh. that was just not possible before. Um, uh, Matt, so I, I I would say I don't see that in the same sense, right? I, I think part of the challenge, and this is I think what Pedro and Vadim were both alluding to, is that the biology of aging is so complex and we really, while we've we've understood at a sort of high level what's happening, I think we've made a lot of progress. There's so many details that we still don't understand that I, I just personally, I, I haven't seen anything on the technology side that I think is going to fundamentally, fundamentally change that. Um, uh, you know, proteomics, metabolomics, genome, people are doing those sorts of multi-omic studies. But again, when you're talking about human aging, because humans age, at such a slower rate, um, it's all correlative, right? You can you can find all sorts of correlations. And I think, you know, in some ways, the in silico uh, uh, conversation and the biomarker conversation are related in that we can we can do those kinds of studies. We can we can model uh, the complexity of aging at the level we understand it right now in silico. We can use artificial intelligence to identify patterns. The problem is, that data is trained off of the limited training set that we've got now. And that's really, I, I mean, I think these are totally worth exploring, but my concern with the approaches of trying to use AI and neural networks to, to predict, do create predictive algorithms is they're based off of a limited training set. And so you're going to learn what you already, from what you already know. My concern is we don't, there's a lot that we don't know. So those are going to be biased sorts of, sorts of outcomes. And I, I, the clocks, I think, in, to some extent, are suffer from the same sort of flaws. What you really want from a clock or a biomarker are predictive algorithms that at the individual level can predict future health outcomes, health span metrics, and lifespan. And we don't have anything yet that, that really does that well. I know people will claim, okay, we've looked at longitudinal studies. And we can show that you know these things are predictive, but, but nobody in a mouse where you could do this experiment has shown that we can measure something in a 12 month old mouse and predict future health outcomes for individual animals. Nobody's done it. And that's a, that's a weakness, I think, in the biomarker and the, the clock um, research. And, and I also, this, maybe I'm wrong, but but my own concerns are a lot of people are counting on the the biomarkers and the clocks. You know, they think that that's going to somehow change the way FDA thinks about approving drugs. I think we're 
at least a decade away from the point where FDA is going to consider any of these things as surrogate endpoints for aging indications. Personally, I think where we should be putting our focus are on functional outcomes of health that are quantifiable and show an improvement in quality of life. That's what FDA is going to want to see. And my own view is that defining aging as a disease makes no difference from the perspective of FDA. They want quantifiable things that you can measure for your endpoints that are predictive for quality or quantity of life. They're not going to accept clocks, I don't think, as surrogate endpoints for clinical trials for a while. So we should keep developing them, but I don't see that as a short-term solution. Vadim, what's your response to that? Well, I agree with Matt. So uh, in terms of the use of the clocks um, as a Kind of measures of aging in, in clinical trials. I think they need to be validated for sure. And the clocks themselves need to be improved uh, and maybe uh, integrated not just across the epigenome, but also across other omics approaches. In general, omics is, is, is such a development, I think, which is really useful in the aging field because of we are able to measure many features of aging simultaneously. So uh, when we profile the epigenome, there are about 30 million uh, CPG sites uh, in, in the mammalian genome. And therefore, uh, you know, some, some of these CPGs there would be associated with various aspects of aging. That, that's why the clocks have been so useful. But when they are integrated, let's say with the transcriptome, where we are able to uh, better assess the change in biology because uh, the, the transcriptome is, 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 is genes, right? So and it's, it's more on the biological side than, than on, the, on the damage side. But there are also damage sides in the transcriptome as well because uh, we are able to assess the errors, so errors in splicing and various other forms of damage. So there is also advantage in the transcriptome. Same thing for metabolome. So where we assess the changes in metabolites, which represent biology, but also, you know, side products, like the, the kind of damage, uh, molecular, molecular damage in, in, the, in the proteins as well. So all of when this all can be integrated, we are much better in assessing um, and quantifying the aging process. I would say better than functional changes because function is very difficult to measure. It's typically, um, uh, in, you know, when we see a, a huge change in function, yes, we, we can measure, but it's just not accurate enough. Whereas integrative biomarker of aging, I think, has a more chance to find more subtle changes so in, in the, during the aging. And then these biomarkers could be different. For example, we could develop biomarker for functional changes, a surrogate for functional changes, or a surrogate for mortality, or a surrogate for aging. Uh, by, by, by aging here, I mean kind of increase in, in, the, in the molecular, uh, I, I would say damage, but damage is not a, a good word really. It's just age-related changes, kind of deleterious age-related changes. This is really what encompasses uh, aging in my mind, not just molecular damage. And so they, these clocks could be different uh, for this. And therefore, when we apply them in clinical trials, what are we going to measure? Do we, uh, is our goal to extend lifespan, extend function, or slow down aging, or, re or rejuvenate in, in some way? So those are different questions, and therefore different biomarkers need to be used and developed. I mean, the, the, the ability of the body to repair and to overcome damage is, is legendary. I mean, I, I, I always remember this a personal anecdote, but I remember interviewing um, an uh, ex-Soviet um, uh, Olympic rowing champion who happened to be in the control room of Chernobyl on the day that it exploded. And he was young, he was extremely healthy. And to my knowledge to, to this date, he has not yet developed cancer, which shows how extraordinary the ability to repair DNA damage is because, I mean, I don't know how much radiation he received, but it was way off the scale. So I've got a quick question if you, for you, if you wouldn't mind, Vadim. This comes from Jose Castro. Um, Jose says, if we're talking about aged cells, which presumably accumulate a lot of damage over time, where does the whole damage go with partial, partial reprogramming? How do cells address this issue? And is it cell dependent? I suspect that's a long answer, but a short one if you would yeah that's a great question um uh, actually this is he's not jose he's jose <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh and so um yeah so uh yeah that's very would be very interesting to address i'm kind of thinking that some of the damage is uh, removed by the you know, you know cellular systems or organismal systems uh 
And because uh, in response to interventions, there is, what we observe is a remodeling, kind of metabolic remodeling. So certain genes are activated and certain processes are activated, and therefore some damage it would be possible to, uh, well, to, to decrease kind of general damage. And therefore, would, this would be, uh, it could be uh, observed as an as a, as a effect of rejuvenation. At a more fundamental level, I think damage can be uh, diluted. So that's what, ha ha I, in my mind, that's kind of the essence of biology in general, like starting from the, like a proto cells when the life evolved. So damage is always produced when organisms live and it has to be kind of diluted when cells divide. Therefore, cell division is kind of the essence of life. Uh, and uh, this also happens during, for example, embryonic development or uh, other processes. Another way would be for, for, for the damage to be asymmetrically distributed. For example, when stem cells divide, so uh, some damage may be you know, transferred you know, to some cells, whereas another, another daughter cell would have uh, less damage. So there are, there are many processes that would allow, uh, that would support. And it so, underlines, it underlines really how, how little we know, how- it, it, it just highlights that we really need to study this, this more. Right? It's just very exciting because it's just so new in the field. And, uh, and can again, I jump in for, for a second? Yeah, I, and I'm going to ask you to talk about unbiased interventions, because that's a real issue with this field, isn't it? It, it is, but I want to talk about rejuvenation just, just for a second, because, I mean, it's it, Vadim's right. It's, it's probably the most exciting area of the field right now. Um, it's not really as new as as it's being made out to be. I mean, if you and it's interesting because first of all, I'd say the damage, the damage itself often isn't what limits function. It's the response to the damage and maybe the chronic inflammation. And if you go back and look, there's a 2009 paper from Pan Zheng's lab with rapamycin where they rejuvenated the immune system in a mouse. Right, so it's not like this is brand new. You can functionally rejuvenate organs and tissues, and we've known about this for at least a decade. Um, I think the question of whether you can completely rejuvenate and get rid of the damage is an open question and still hasn't been demonstrated. But just by fixing the, the response to the damage, you can actually restore function, in at least in a mouse, and I believe in, in people as well. So I think this idea of rejuvenation is, is immensely important, and it's one of the most exciting things to come along in the field in a long time. But it's not as new as it gets presented. We've known about ways to rejuvenate function in, in animals for more than a decade. Um, so, okay, so now unbiased a, a approaches. I mean, I, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, and I think, you know, my personal view is that um, I personally have a lot more confidence in discoveries that are made when people don't go looking for those answers, right? I think oftentimes in science, you know, we get fooled when we think we know what the answer is and we do experiments to try to, to try to prove those answers. And, I, and this I was alluding to earlier, I think a lot of the progress in the field that happened in the early 2000s came from people taking these unbiased agnostic approaches where you just look across the entire genome from a genetic perspective and ask what are the genes that affect lifespan in yeast and worms and flies where you can do that at that sort of scale. And one of the exciting things that emerged was multiple labs converged on the same set of genes. And one of those being mTOR, which is what I study, one of the things I study. Um, so that gives a lot of confidence that those are real and Im important biological uh, discoveries. To some extent, I would like to see us return to that, or at least see some people return to that on a, a pharmacological level. I, I think we could do the same kinds of large scale unbiased approaches to identify small molecule interventions or combinations of interventions that affect aging. Um, and again, try to broaden out and stop looking un under the lamppost um, at what we, what we think we already know. So that's one of the things that, 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 that I, I, we're trying to develop in my lab and, and I, I know others are trying to develop as well. And, and I, I think there will be value in, in, again, trying to take a step back, not study what we think we know and just let the biology tell us what's actually important. Pedro, I want to come to you, and uh, as we come uh, to finishing up on this session, I, I mean, again, it's just flown by, but Pedro, what's really exciting you in this field at the moment? Matt talked a bit about rejuvenation studies. What is really exciting you? 
So, so to pick upon what what uh, both Vadim and Matt said, you know, we we have this reprogramming and this potential to rejuvenate human cells, which I I think it's 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 very exciting. It's what we're focusing on in youth bio, and and we're doing some work on that. Um, I mean, as as both Matt and Vadim said, there's still a lot of question marks. Um, as Vadim mentioned, maybe you know, damage is asymmetrical, so maybe there is a selection process. So, so it's important to remember that reprogramming is a very inefficient approach or technique, you know, it's a small percentage of cells that actually gets reprogrammed. So maybe the cells that get reprogrammed are those that have less damage. So it's not just about reversing damage, it's just a selection for the the, the cells that have less damage, uh, which which actually you, you can say already happens in, in, in the germ line. So for example, in, in sperm, that's, that's, you know, it's the sperm that gets the less damage that gets to make a baby or, or an offspring, depending on the species. So that already somehow happens a little bit, although in, in, in different fashion. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's, so there's still a lot of unknowns, but I would say that's, that's the most, or the greatest, that, that's the area that has the greatest potential. And actually coming back to your previous question, um, you know, about could we have a, a technology that truly, you know, revolutionizes the field? Um, I, I, I mean, I agree with Matt, I think it's unlikely but if there is one technology, one approach, there would be, you know, true rejuvenation. I mean, if you're doing a, a clinical trial, or if you're doing an approach on slowing aging, I mean, you have to do a. I mean, it, it just takes time, and you, it's it's not it's not easy to validate and to get FDA approval. But if you actually rejuvenate, if you could actually rejuvenate um, with a strong, you know, effect, actually rejuvenate, a, even if not a whole human being, but at least a, an organ, um, now that would be revolutionary. From a you know from various perspectives, uh, including from a, a, a regulatory perspective, because we're talking about you know re you know reversing aging. You're not just talking about slowing it down, which is much harder to show and to to obtain approval. You're talking about reversing it, which is much easier to show. So that would be, I think, it's unlikely, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. So that that would be the the revolutionary technology that that maybe just just maybe is. Uh, is is on the horizon or maybe it will happen and what organ system would you concentrate on um i would concentrate on the immune system actually uh because it's systemic because if you can rejuvenate the immune system you can affect everywhere in the in the body so so that that would be my choice um uh, i mean for for practical reasons you know it, it's it's uh, you know the brain obviously springs to mind because i think that's one of the scariest aspects about uh, growing old is is is, is brain aging um, but it's much harder to to intervene on um, but so so I would say I would say the immune system because it's systemic um, so for practical reasons also because if you can rejuvenate the immune system it's going to have uh, an impact on other organs as well interesting um Vadim what's your thought what's really exciting you apart from your own rejuvenation work and reprogram which I know is uh, going great guns at the moment I think earlier, earlier I already addressed that question and when I mentioned not just rejuvenation, but also the tools and uh, the fundamental biology of aging, uh, as well as the, the potential success of human biology, human, the use of human gerobotractors. I think these are four, kind of, uh, in my mind, top, um, top priorities. But uh, we also need to look broader, uh, study broader in the aging field, because sometimes discoveries just happen you know, just because somebody had a great idea, we need to support fundamental research. We, we need more kind of fundamental discoveries. Uh, and uh, I think that's what we observe because NIA, NIA uh, has been great in my mind. They, they, they really do a good job supporting research, but also now we have, um, you know, uh, other funders, which is also all these companies are formed. So I think these are all positive developments uh, in the field. So I'm getting a sense from all of you that actually the field is poised at a waterfall moment. And that's partly because we're seeing a great influx of funding, uh, partly because, uh, well, Matt, may, Matt is shaking his uh, head, but perhaps the, perhaps the government funding is not quite as uh, in place as it should be. And, uh, and actually, before I sum up, Matt, do you think there's a residual issue with uh, public funding um, in this area? Definitely. I think we haven't yet uh, seen the the shift at the level of uh, policymakers and, and public funding. I think that'll happen. And, and I think the, the funding coming into the field is really important. The reason I was shaking my head is I actually think 
the waterfall moment is because because the 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 biology has gotten to the point where I think we can have a realistic impact uh, uh, clinically and. And, and I think that's what's really leading to the, the funding coming into the field, the recognition that, you know, we're, we're there, right? We're ready to actually start to move some of this in. And, and I just want to say, I'm shocked because I actually sound like I'm more optimistic than, than Pedro. I actually think that rejuvenation um, can and will happen and that some of the interventions that we are studying now will have a functional rejuvenating effect in people. I, and I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm known as the guy who's bullish on rapamycin and I absolutely believe that rapamycin can knock down inflammation and, and functionally rejuvenate multiple tissues and organs. We know it's true in mice and I'm pretty confident that it's true in people. So I think, but I agree with 100% with what he said. From a clinical trial perspective, that's much easier to show an effect if you can make things better. And so that's partly why I'm so enthusiastic about things moving forward, because I think that is a real possibility. We're not going to take a 50-year-old or an 80-year-old and turn them into a 20-year-old, but we can restore function in, in older people. And I think that's really, really exciting. Well, on that note, uh, let's end. I mean, it's been a, a really stimulating discussion. It is an enormously exciting area and there is a lot of interest coming into it. And actually, I think it was you, Vadim, made the point that it's attracting a whole new uh, range of very talented researchers who are coming into this field. And actually, I think that's a key point. Once you get a sudden influx of talent, and particularly from other disciplines who are not hidebound in the ways that have previously uh, been, uh, been found, but who bring completely new thinking to this area, who avoid the silos, um, I think we're really poised for something very exciting uh, indeed. So Pedro, uh, Matt and Vadim, thank you so much for being with us and for providing such an exciting and stimulating discussion. And uh, those of you on the call, uh, we are now going to uh, just uh, regroup uh, for 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes after the hour, whatever the hour is in your particular time zone, we'll reconvene for our final and really important session, which is looking at how we translate those great discoveries that are now coming uh, forward in this area of science into products, treatments, and interventions that people can use. See you in 10 minutes. Bye for now.
Hello and welcome back to the third session of this Rejuveron Live Longer, Age Better Symposium. So we've had two really top sessions so far. We've talked a bit about the kind of things that people are looking for, the different types of uh, investors in this field. We've looked at some of the outstanding science in the field and the way that there are some really important new discoveries which are making this a waterfall moment in this area. But now we come to perhaps the most important session of all, which is how do we turn all of that knowledge into therapies, interventions, treatments that are available to everybody? And to help us with this session, we have two people. One is Anne Bela, who's uh, from Rejuvenate. Uh, uh, sorry, I've just got that wrong. Um, Rejuvenate Biomed, sorry. Um, and that's one of the companies of uh, Rejuveron. And uh, they're in now clinical trials. It's no longer preclinical, it's clinical trials for sarcopenia. We also have Richard Barker. Um, I've known Richard for many, many years now. We'll perhaps not say too long. Thank you, Richard. Um, Richard's a real expert on translation and innovation. For many years, uh, he was Director General of the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries, and he has had many other senior roles in the biopharmaceutical uh, area. And perhaps his uh, greatest um, qualification for this particular session is a book uh, that he wrote called Bioscience Lost in Translation. Very appropriate. So Anne, let's start with you because you really are turning this work into reality. Thank you very much, Vivian. We're trying, right? We're doing our utmost best. Um, it also is, of course, one of our missions uh, is a very personal story also for us to move into the aging field coming from the more traditional um, drug development side. Um, so I, I will just give you a little bit of my story and then you say, oh, me, Vivian, like it's enough. <laughs> Let's move on. So I will, because I can talk about the company, of course, for ages. So uh, within, uh, of course, Rejuvenate Biomet, what we do is we want to keep people healthy for life. That's that main goal. That's the flag on top of that mountain over there. So we're trying to figure out how to get there because we do indeed, as has been mentioned already before, we, there are some challenges. I mean, scientifically seen, biology of aging is very complex. We do have the hallmarks of aging, fortunately, to give us some guidance there. Um, next to that, of course, whatever happens now, is giving us an output way much later when we focus on aging. It's a slow process. So that gives some challenges. And from a regulatory perspective, as has been mentioned before, we will need to help the regulators and to help to educate them on why we think this uh, could be um, a real good approach to tackle aging itself rather than individual diseases. Now for us to be able to translate all the marvelous work that has been done already before, we took a specific approach. There are many approaches. There's not just one good approach. So ours is just as good as any other. So I think we have to bring together all the knowledge and our approach is coming from a very simplistic view. Uh, we thought, let's think about this concept. If you're aging and you want to do something about it and you want to take medication, then what's most important? Probably that the product is safe. That's going to be a very important element. So we thought, okay, but how do you know if a product is safe without going through that long drug development trajectory? You have to be able to look at data. Well, there are data, compounds which have been on the market already for quite a long time. We have data of those. So we looked at um, a whole bunch of compounds out there, agnostic for the indication for which they were around, and to find if they would be safe for our target population. Once when we had that information, we identified the mechanisms that were being impacted by these compounds, because of course, in the meantime, a lot of new knowledge came up around the specific compounds. And then we tried to figure out how these mechanisms were now important within the biology of aging, using the hallmarks um, of aging as a kind of guidance tool in the background. When we had that map, we thought, well, you know, since it is so complex, it's probably good to make a combination. So we thought, let's see how we can push at two different angles in these hallmarks, because they are intertwined, 
but still figure out by doing that how we can have a larger effect, pure theoretically, pure in silico. When we had that information, we thought, okay, we have now multiple opportunities. Now take the Admetox data, which are available in humans, to see if we can safely combine them. That seemed to be a, a very um, workable approach. And then we thought, okay, now we have this theoretical prediction. Now we need to show that it works. So we moved first into C. elegans to see if we had some functional outcomes there, giving us an idea on the health span. We looked at mobility, we looked at pharyngeal pumping, we looked at muscle structure, and we could see that the prediction was holding. That was interesting. So we moved into the mice and we said, okay, in mice, we want to do, do two things. First, you want to look at it something like a knockout mice to see if you knock out and you have an accelerated aging, can you make a difference? But also looking at normal old mice. So we take that approach. And the compound that we identified, RGX01, we evaluated that also in the mice. And then again, we saw that what we predicted in silico, confirmed in C. elegans, was also confirmed in mice. So we're currently actually in the stage that we are in humans. And we will do the reverse translation there as well to make sure that what we predict and how we predict really holds in the long run. Now, the data, of course, have to provide us insights, which they did. And as we mentioned, there is no regulatory path forward for aging. So we defined that based on our data, we would be able to make a difference in sarcopenia, which is muscle failure. Within muscle failure, you have different levels. You have the chronic sarcopenia, which comes by age. We can see it, people have difficulties in walking and, and moving, getting up and so on. But you also have the acute setting, which is induced after muscle disuse. So for instance, if you have um, a broken leg, a hip replacement, or bed rest for any other type of evaluation. Sarcopenia pops up. So we thought, hmm, this is interesting because now you have an acute setting that you can study and that can give you already insights for the long run, the chronic one. This one can give you information on aging in general. So let's take that approach so that we can create on the short term value for the investors, but also in the long run, continue to focus on, on that aspect. The other thing we do is, so within sarcopenia, it's, it's multi-level, right? So it's uh, neuro, neuronal cells are important, muscle cells are important, inflammation is important. The crosstalk between the, so the neuromuscular junction is important, the crosstalk between the different cell types. So there were a whole bunch of mechanisms involved. Once when we saw that we had a functional impact, it's only then that we went back to check the mechanisms. Because as has been mentioned already before, we want to try to be as unbiased as possible as we can be in science and to see where this information guides us to. So now that we know that that system works, we are having other compounds coming through and going in that, uh, into that development route. Um, that's a little bit what we do within Rejuvenate. So we will go up to phase 2B, where we can show that the product really works in a specific indication and then go into other age-related diseases as well, based on mechanisms that are being shared between different organs, helping also the FDA and EMA to move into the field of how to deal with these compounds. So if we can work with them and help them to understand what we see, it will also make it easier for them to come up with a solution. Because also, as I mentioned before, they want to. They, they want to go there, but we need to help them. We need to give them the information and the data to get there. That's in a nutshell what we do at Rejuvenate Environment. So that was, and that was really interesting. And so, and I, apologies, I'm in Chicago and I just happen to be right next to a fire station. So you hear the fire engine, sorry about that. Um, so there's a very clear strategy here in which you've thought not only about you know, the biology and about uh, a, a, and an unbiased way of thinking about it, but you've of, of, of treatments, but you've also thought about it in terms of how the FDA and EMEA might re react. So, for instance, these combination of compounds you know have a high degree of safety attached to them already, so they're not going to frighten the horses. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so let me now turn to. Richard Barker. Richard, you have enormous experience in this area. This whole thing of lost in translation is a, a really important and significant problem. And 
it, it's a, an important and significant problem in everyday pharmaceuticals, if I can uh, call them that. But in ageing, there are some particular issues. No, exactly. And I just want to congratulate Anne on what she's been doing, um, because uh, I pick up two things from that story. One is um, reverse translation, which my book does not talk about. Uh, please do buy the book that talks about forward translation, but reverse translation, um, using uh, combinations of products that are already well recognized in terms of safety, but also educating the regulators, because I, I think of the time when biological drugs were coming out, uh, it was a matter of the regulators and the industry feeling their way together so that they, they, there was confidence because many things could go wrong, many things did go wrong with bio, biological agents. But anyway, um, ju just to make uh, a few points and for, in response to the questions that were circulated. Um, firstly, this isn't like most other areas. Uh, I can only reinforce what Matt Cabelin said, that uh, Cabelin said, that it's not about um, developing drugs to combat aging. It's about developing drugs that deal with the quality and quantity of life. I wrote it down, Matt, um, that aging, the de deterioration in quality and quantity of life that, that aging brings. Uh, I mean, what, do, what is necessary for clinical development? You've got to have a target product profile, which incorporates an indication, uh, the outcome of which you can measure. It's got to have clear endpoints, and I think we've had discussion already about how the biomarkers of aging, important though they are, are not likely to be taken as surrogate endpoints. It's the usual clinical endpoints. Um, those trials have to be adequately powered. You have to have ethics approval. Uh, you have to have a committed trialists, and, and that's not trivial because in other words, you have to find clinical leaders who are prepared to stake part of their reputation on working with you to, uh, to deal with whatever the condition is. And you obviously have to have in out criteria and so on. Um, and so it's a matter, and I think Anne has discovered one of these possibilities. It's a matter of finding indications um, that correlate with or are um, symptoms of aging rather than aging itself. Um, there, there are clearly others that one could pick. One could obviously pick progeria, the, the, the very sad disease where some uh, kids don't go beyond the age of 13 because they very rapidly decline. I don't think we really know whether that's how good a model, so to speak, that is of, of, of average, um, averaging age. Um, I, I think of the field of senescence, which I'm very excited about, senolytics. But you're going to have to find diseases where senescent cells are part of the mechanism uh, of, of uh, the pathogenesis of the disease. And then just as Anne has done, work on those diseases uh, and then correlate that with um, measurements of senescent cells. And as you, as you say, Anne, to educate the regulators as you go through. Um, I mean, that we do have a whole host of diseases which are age related. I mean, cancer is the most obvious one. Uh, but many, most of the inflammatory diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, um, there are very many diseases which are age-related. The question is the extent to which aging is a central mechanism of those diseases. Uh, and can we, can we work on them in a way, um, as we just heard, work on them in, the, uh, in a way that paves the path for broader uh, development of uh, clinical development of age-related uh, treatments. Um, I, I really like the idea of long COVID as a, as a test bed because I suspect a lot of the, um, the conditions that uh, accompany long COVID um, are endemic in aging. But long COVID reminds me of one thing, Viv, which is I've written books about precision medicine. Um, maybe there is such a thing as precision aging. Maybe we don't all age the same way. I mean, self-evidently we don't. Um, and therefore, um, the idea that there's a silver bullet that prevents all of us from aging, I think, is quite, um, quite fictional. Um, we, we know that biology is, is actually not a series of very clear genetically defined um, uh, receptor sites. We have to hit with particular molecules and then all will be well. We are all complex interactomes of proteins and genes and epigenetics and so on. 
Um, and therefore, the way in which aging affects that interactome is probably very different from one person to another. Um, and so, therefore, I think it's some way off that we will come up with me medicines, particularly novel medicines that have never been trialed uh, uh, before on human uh, human patients that, that very large numbers of people will benefit from. Um, I think it's going to be a stepwise process. Um, maybe treatment of long COVID will be one of those entry points, actually. Uh, but long COVID is pretty uh, heterogeneous. Uh, it, it's sort of kicking off a discussion maybe with Anne. I'm, I'm interested in this. You said you can educate the regulators. But I've looked, for example, at the polypill. Um, most people probably knows what the polypill is. It's five different medicines, all of which have been taken in huge quantities by millions of people. But getting the regulators to approve a polypill, which is a combination of commonly taken medicines for, uh, in this particular case, uh, greater healthy longevity, the reduction of cardiovascular conditions and so on, has been an enormous problem. So tell us, Anne, about the, 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 the dialogue with regulators and how far along they've got. Yes, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, Dan? Because you, not only do we not age the same one human to another, but actually even within ourselves, some of our organs age at a greater rate than others. So this is immensely uh, complex. And it, it, yes, how do you educate regulators? Yes. So I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's just having the data available and showing them, for instance, in our case with RGX01, that the compound does work in one specific disease and having also the data at hand where you can already see from a preclinical perspective that the compound also have an impact on other age-related diseases. And it goes a little bit back and actually stole uh, this uh, way of, of uh, making it more visual from Matthias who's using it for another purpose. But the way I look at it and the way I always explain it to people, including also the regulators, is that if you look at the world map and you have a lot of different countries in there and every country has its own color, it's a very beautiful mosaic. Now, if you would color all these countries based on the language that is spoken within those countries, then all of a sudden you see that there is a language being spoken in different continents. So the color of the map will look very different. The countries for me are the organs and the languages are for me the mechanisms. So yes, it are different organs, but there are similar mechanisms that are being important in those. And indeed, depending on which organ in your body is the most vulnerable, that's probably the first age-related disease that will pop up, which will be a different one between the three of us. So that's how we explain it to them. And they are very aware. I mean, they are scientifically sound. These are smart people, but they are working within um, an area which has been defined for them. It's, it's a specific borders have been drawn for them and they have to be able to manage their work within those. So if we can help them to lower the borders between the different areas in, in regulators, then they can get there. So it's definitely not that they're not willing to, but we need to give them enough ammunition as well to get to that stage where they can really defend that way of thinking. One of the key issues in this field uh, is when you give a particular, you know, what point in a, in, in a disease process, at yeah. what age do you give a particular treatment? And we've seen it to some extent with, with Alzheimer's treatments where you're having a lot of people saying, actually, if we knew that people were at risk and we gave this uh, medicine, whatever it is, this intervention 20 years earlier, we would see a far greater uh, success. I suppose they would say that, wouldn't they? But, <laughs> but you see the point I'm, I, I'm making is choosing the point of intervention is, is really important in this field. And Richard? Yeah, it's not only choosing, but getting people to take a drug 20 years before they have symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, and depending on how, how um, challenging uh, the drug and its potential side effects are. Uh, so um, I think actually Alzheimer's is a good, um, so to speak, uh, exemplar for a number of things. The long time period it probably takes. Um, 
the, 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 the early um, use of biomarkers to identify a potential further development of the disease. And I think, for example, of, of a lot of the proteomic analysis that's going on these days, with proteomics and to some extent metabolomics, you can identify that a disease is going to develop maybe two or three years ahead. Two or three years is better than 20 years for that matter. Um, so I think the, um, the, the, the challenge is going to be not just getting regulators to agree that uh, a therapy is worthwhile, but the patients who have to take it, if it turns out to be the case, that you have to take it for life or you have to take it 20 years before um, the, whatever the condition is, is going to emerge. But that choice of when you uh, when a patient takes it is also key to the success of a particular medicine, because if you give it at the wrong time, then you may, may see no effects at all from what actually may be a very successful potential medicine. And then you, you then you fail. Yes, and, and that's a very valid point, Vivian. So that's also the reason why we think that first you should go in into a more diseased setting, figure out what can you do from an acute perspective, what can you do there from a preventive perspective, and then see what is the best approach. It also can be just as well that you can give the medication for a specific time frame, and then you have an effect that stays for quite a bit so that you go more like on, on once uh, a month or one month in three months that you go on the medication. So it's a lot of questions definitely there. But giving that stepwise approach of being able to use the compound in different situations, acute, chronic, and also in prevention, and also having an impact on multiple organs, that's going to give us the guidance. Um, I'm very impatient, so I want to go really fast, but I also want to do it right. So that's why we know that there are a lot of questions and we need to tackle them one by one. Also, the, the, the element on the biomarkers is also a little bit coming back to the reverse translation. First, you need to know that you have a functional outcome and you will need to measure from the very first onset until when you have the functional outcome, what exactly changed. Then you need to identify the biomarkers or matrix. I don't think we'll have one biomarker, most likely it will be a matrix, a combination of different markers. And then the next step is in the next trials to look at these again and see that if you reverse them, to the normal state that you indeed have a function. <laughs> so it's, it's really a stepwise approach, which we have to plan very carefully, need to take care. And that's also why in the clinical trial that we currently are doing, which is where we created an acute sarcopenia setting in human beings, like almost an, an animal model, but then in humans, that we take all these samples. We take a lot of PK samples. We take a lot of um, samples for what we call exploratory endpoints so that later on we can come back to these data. Um, but it's all about well, what people have said before as well, we need to collect, 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 and then bring all the information together and then see what the mutual information is bringing us. Viv, do you mind yeah. if I ask again a couple of questions? Yeah. Is that all right? So the, the first is you, your lead product is a combination of two commonly used products? Correct, yes. Mm. And that's, so, so your protectability is on the combination and it's yes. never been used for sarcopenia or whatever it is you choose. It's even, it's even broader. So what we could see is that when we combined these two products, we had a new characteristic. So just to give an example, if you put mice on a treadmill and you put them on one of the compounds, nothing is happening. But if after, um, after 18 weeks or of treatment, you put them on there with the compound, you see that magically, they function much better. They can run longer. Um, grip strengths give the same uh, elements. So we saw a lot of these functional outcomes, which were improved after, but only we only saw it with the combination. When we looked mechanistically, we see that sometimes it's a contribution of one, sometimes of the other one, sometimes of both of them, and sometimes individually of none. So it's extreme, scientifically, it's extremely, extremely interesting to see what happens there. Yeah. And it's all about um, muscle function, or does it go deeper than that in terms of aging mechanisms? It, it goes deeper than that. It's, it's very uh, generic uh, mechanisms. It's uh, inflammation, denervation. Um, we have autophagy, mitochondrial function. So it's, it's a lot of the different elements that you see coming back. 
but these elements, because it's just one word, right? Mitochondrial function, but behind mitochondrial function is like a bazillion things that can be important. So we might be pushing on a couple, another compound might be doing something else, but we all call it mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what's happening, but it's just extremely interesting. So we hope that now that we have functional improvement, that the mechanisms are going to learn us where the important mechanisms might, might be for further um, science as well. Can I just come to that perception problem that we've discussed uh, earlier in this symposium, which is that um, uh, there are views about aging, you know, that you, particularly about trying to make yourself younger there's a kind of uh, view that that's not what you should be doing, that you should just accept your lot and get on with it. And, uh, you know, you can see it in the reaction to women who use um, anti-aging creams, when anti-aging, by the way, is the thing, single thing that is most likely to sell the face cream. But to, to be serious about this, if you approach uh, the regulators and say, we're coming to you with the rejuvenation project or product. Um, are they likely to clutch their pearls and throw up their hands in horror? Do you have to approach them in a different way and say, this is not about rejuvenation. This is not about anti-aging. This is about treating a specific problem, which happens to be more common with age. Anne. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit in between what you just mentioned. So you don't have to go in there and tell them we're talking to you to discuss a specific disease. But of course, you also should not go in there and say like, we're going to keep everybody healthy for the rest of their life. I mean, that's, that's, that's of course, something. but if you go in there and you explain to them that you're working on a compound that has the, the potential to impact multiple age-related diseases, and as such, there is a biological reasoning behind the fact that you might have a big impact on the biology of aging overall. That helps. I mean, they are they are not easily shocked. Eh? They have seen a lot. They, have, they did hear a lot. But it's all about the science. If you show that what you are doing is scientifically based, and if it's not too far away, and for us being in the aging field, a lot of these elements are much more acceptable, but we have to understand that other people are living in a different world and that we have to approach them with the words and their way of thinking to help them get into our world. That helps. Yeah. Richard, would you agree with that? Yes, and I, I absolutely would. Um, I think it's also a bit generational. So our, our parents, if I can put it this way, Viv, were, were likely, are likely to say, um, oh, you know, you just have to accept it, you know, wear and tear, get older, um, get used to it. Uh, I think, I think... Talk very... you. you can talk for yourself, uh, Richard. I'm, I'm uh, resisting. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking for your pet. I'm talking for the generation ahead of us. Ah, all right then. Um, the, 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 us and any succeeding generations, no, nobody wants muscle weakness, nobody wants brain fade, nobody wants arthritis. So all of these conditions... Uh, I think we, we're ready to see treatments for. Um, uh, the, the, the key question is what sequence and in what way. And I really, I really, like, um, I really like Anne's approach, as you can tell. Um, the problem is um, you know, whether we can, we can get the cl clinical development system and the regulators geared up for a succession of products whose fundamental goal is to deal with the mechanisms of aging with the indications that we talk to them about uh, being the sort of first indications of a wave of uh, potential therapies. As you mentioned, Viv, you know, anti-aging skin creams are, are selling like hotcakes. Uh, there is apparently an inverse correlation between their price and their efficacy, but there we go. Um, but there are gonna be a lot of nutritionals or nutraceuticals that the consumers will take as long as the nutraceutical manufacturers don't make health claims that they can't they can't support medically. So there's going to be the development, I think, of the whole nutraceutical industry. And Anne and others are showing us the way for the development of, so to speak, pres prescription pharmaceuticals, both of which can be based on a better understanding of the mechanisms. Um, a couple of interesting comments coming in. Uh, uh, Boris Jordovich 
uh, is saying compared to five years ago, it's now already much more accepted and acceptable when you target aging. And actually you say you treat aging. And Walter Crompton puts the other side of this um, argument, which is actually similar to the arguments that you hear in obesity. You know, there are lots of pre-adult interventions that will significantly, we know, extend our healthy life. To talk about exotic drugs and long COVID is in general trying to get the horses back in the barn after you left the door in an open field, uh, uh, open all night. So I, I think what uh, Walter is, is getting at there is that we know there are lots of things that extend aging. For instance, not developing obesity, you know, not smoking, you know, all those, all those things. But the trouble I suggest, Walter, is that we are where we are, and a lot of people have not done those uh, things. And there is a huge tsunami of age-related disease coming towards us, which we know that no health systems around the world can possibly cope with. So we're really uh, desperate for these kind of treatment and we know that the you know be healthier exercise more eat more fruit we could all say if you stop people in the street they can all tell you what leads to a healthy life but they don't all do it so yes <laughs> um uh, Anne, it, it, what are your thoughts about how to get people to treat this really seriously i mean is it the economic argument combined with the good science it's it's probably a little bit of all these elements and i, I also liked a lot the, co the comment from uh, boris so as you as you know we started in 2017 um at that moment in time uh, when i talked about aging and healthy aging uh, a lot of people would uh, from their head and uh, there was even an article like uh, developing um an elixir for life. So, and I'm like, well, that's not what we're doing, right? But since, and, and I know it's horrible because it, it has impacted all of us dramatically, but thanks to COVID, I should almost say, people now understand what we're saying. They saw that the elderly are more vulnerable. They have seen that, yes, there is no medication around and you can look at other medication out there and it can contribute to a new condition. So for us, it really was a game changer in how people are looking at us and how they start to understand what exactly we're doing. And with your regards to, we all know what we do, what we have to do. I'm always saying like, look, I sport every day. I'm always eating healthy. I never drink alcohol. I go to bed on time. Really? I don't think so. So there is this balance in life that you have to figure out. Uh, but at the end of the road, we all want to be healthy, obviously. So it's, uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I was so intrigued by <laughs> So we've talked a bit about the regulatory uh, challenges, and uh, we've talked a bit about timing in relation to clinical trials. But Anne, what, what else makes a clinical trial uh, in this area successful? What are the essential prerequisites? So um, the way we do it right now is that we take that specific indication from a regulatory perspective, but we add in a lot of mechanistic elements. So for instance, the phase one that we're doing, normally you do a phase one for safety and PK assessment, because we also have a new formulation. In that, mechanism, in that phase one study, we have now built in the mechanisms. So more, the more that we can build in mechanistic elements, the better, like for instance, we people need to be uh, on an, there will be an isodynamic and isometric measurement, we'll take muscle biopsies. then we'll, we'll do all the assessment for muscle mass, then we put them in a cost for two weeks. After two weeks, we'll do all the same measurements. They'll be on the compound for another four weeks, we'll do all the same measurements, and then they get an additional health program to make sure that they're completely fit again. So, but in those aspects, we take so, we take as much blood as is adequately allowed. So of course we're not overdoing it because it's an official double blind um, uh, controlled study. But we, we need to make sure that we can measure as many different parameters as possible. Everything we're measuring in that specific trial, it's not only for acute sarcopenia and for sarcopenia, but it's also for the health state because these people are between 65 and 75. So we start to get some more understanding and learning. Then after this study, of course, we go into patients. Again, there we will be checking on how can we approach that in a way that we can start already by having longitudinal data. 
start in a small setting, grow it up, broaden it, but keep the, the, the patients in there that were in the trial already from day on, one onwards. So it, it's, it takes a lot of creativity to figure out how to collect as much information as possible in the broader aging setting, but we cannot do a study for aging. I mean, you cannot do that. Yeah, I mean, Richard, that sounds extremely sensible that you're collecting, you're using the clinical trial really as an opportunity to collect as much data as possible. You're sweating the assets, I think the expression yes. would be. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. I really love the sound of doing that. And that's, I, I think, the way forward. It is simplified by the fact that we're dealing here with combination of already proven safe drugs. Uh, so there's a whole dimension of difficulty that, that Anne has uh, been able to sidestep. I think Boris's second comment, I think it might be worth just briefly reflecting on it. It says working on aging is hugely beneficial for any government in the long run. Uh, the problem, of course, is that governments do not do much in the long run. They do it in the electrical, electoral cycle. And therefore, one of the challenges we haven't talked about um, is how cost effectiveness is built into this and whether there will be the need for different kinds of business models for something that we give people for 20 or 30 years, initially uh, to slow the mechanisms of aging and ultimately to postpone or completely eliminate uh, age-related diseases. So I think we have some work to do, but no time to discuss it now, um, about what does the business model look like for this new regenerative um, and or um, uh, age-related pharmaceutical industry as they start to talk to governments about how they're going to price and how they're going to be rewarded. And the health economics are enormously important. And, and by the way, folks, if you have um, children who are going into <laughs> their careers, health economist or data scientist, I promise you, they will keep you in your old age. Uh, they are they're so uh, sought after and in really short supply. But the health economics are an absolutely critical part of this, aren't it? And, and also, perhaps, I suspect, the psychological side, the social sciences, we tend not to think about the social sciences, but actually in these particular instances, maybe they're more important than uh, perhaps in, in, in other areas. What do you think, Anne? It, it absolutely is. So um, we had a conversation with Emma on how reimbursement would look like, because that's already going into the step, like what's the government going to do with these type of compounds? It became very clear that if you can show via a surrogate marker, one far, far away <laughs> in time. But if you can show that the person does benefit, there is a reason to believe that they benefit, then, then it's going to be very much easier. So that's why also within the sarcopenia field, we are tackling those elements like functionality. They can stay longer at home, uh, more independent. And that's where the cost savings come from. Because these people now can also contribute again. They can be there for the grandchildren, but they can also have that wonderful knowledge and wisdom that they have built. They can now use it and share it with others. So you kind of create that thing. And also the other reason was when you can move, you are able to have a social life. So, and that social aspect is so important. My daughter is a psychologist. So she reminds me all the time that this is a very important aspect. And one helps the other. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be another group, perhaps here online, that is very well established to do the lobbying and do that aspect. It's not my world. I'm more on the scientific and the, the, the development side, but we are looking into it. We are looking into, we're trying to understand what happens there and how potentially uh, things, things can be moved uh, forward. Now, the fact that we're using these safe compounds might help the field move forward. So we are sure that what we're doing now will give a lot of learnings to other companies as well on how to develop new compounds in that field. But if, I think in the beginning, we really have to be careful that we are not making any safety mistakes in that aging field. So actually, the people that succeed first in this area have an enormous responsibility because if they mess it up, yes, then it's going to put the field back enormously and Boris is making a series of points here but the, you know it, it, it's the essence is there's um, a big gap between the research side and the clinical side and you know there are things 
when a, 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 a medicine comes out or a treatment comes out, you need to bridge that gap, not simply to make the drug available as in, you know, it's gone through the uh, regulatory hurdles, but actually that clinicians are prepared to prescribe it. And, you know, there's a real piece of education always needed in these new areas to ensure that clinicians are able to understand why it's important to, to give these drugs. And it's not just another wizard wheeze from a from a you know profit driven pharmaceutical uh, industry, which tends to be the default, I think, uh, in some doctors. Richard, how important is it to bridge that clinical divide? I think it, I think that's the, the my main message is that the lab to clinic gap is greater in this field than in almost any other area that I'm aware of. I think Anne's strategy bridges it really uh, beautifully. Um, I think that big we haven't talked about the large pharmaceutical companies and their interest in this area, which I think are kind of patchy. So a lot of early stage companies expect to sell themselves or their products to major pharmaceutical companies down the, down the line. Um, I think they, they, they will need the same sort of education that the regulators need uh, in order to accept and welcome these kinds of products because they will not, as I say, I think the business models might well be different. The clinical development uh, strategy as Anne has described might well be different. What, the, what she's going to show, um, you know, uh, Pfizer will be different from what normally they, they get to see. So I think, I think the, uh, we shouldn't forget that the large pharmaceutical companies who have the, the, the reach, the distribution reach, the market power to take this to billions of people, they'll need educating too. That's a very interesting point. So I'm now going to give you my famous Vivian Parry magic wand. And I'm going to ask each of you, what would you do with your magic wand to create uh, maybe just one thing that you would do to create an environment in which these drugs or these interventions uh, could go forward more easily? Um, Anne, what would you like to do with your magic wand? Changing the regulatory trajectories that are needed for approvals. Because my father is in need as well, Boris, I'm with you. <laughs> Richard, you've yeah, got so, more experience so with the regulators some, than Yeah, some, some time ago, I, I, I did a lot of work with regulators on adaptive development and conditional approval, which ended up being quite useful when it came to uh, the COVID vaccines. And so their minds were prepared for the idea that you give conditional approval to something earlier in its development. And so I, I know that regulators talk to each other all the time. So I would put some flesh on the bones of what Anne just said. Um, maybe as a community, we need to convene um, the regulators together on a global basis, use a few case examples, a few use cases, like the products that Anne's developing, but a few other products from other companies, and say, okay, if these, this is the beginning of a trend towards the ability to, to offer healthy longevity to, to billions of people. How do you want us to take this forward? What kind of dialogue, what kind of data? How are you gonna to work together to, to appraise these medicines? So, so I volunteered to pull together an international group of regulators and, and pose, them, uh, pose them those questions or what? Who knows? But somebody needs to do that. Yes, yeah, somebody needs to do it. And also, I would suggest that you need to bring all the companies. There are myriads of small companies involved in this area. You need to bring them all together because, you know, the misstep of one could affect the whole field. So actually convening um, companies is as important as convening the regulators. So uh, it's been a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, it's the end of this has come far too soon. I'm enormously uh, grateful to Richard Barker and to Anne Brillau uh, and uh, the best of luck with those clinical trials. Um, uh, I'm sure they're, they're gonna be successful. Uh, that's, I feel it in my water. <laughs> and with that, uh, I'm going to thank you all for uh, listening and being uh, with us. And I'm gonna pass over to Malika Schroeder again to say her final words. Malika. 
Well, once again, I'm going to repeat the question I asked right in the beginning. Which wonders will exceed your greatest expectations? Well, we've got at least one answer. This symposium definitely exceeded our greatest expectations, thanks to our amazing lineup of speakers. So thank you all for bringing this symposium to life. Also a big thank you to Vivian Perry, who distilled everything so beautifully and elegantly and helped us navigate the sea of information and insights. And thank you, of course, to everyone who's still on and watching. We truly hope that we inspired you. If you wanna learn more about Rejuveron, please visit our website at www.rejuveron.com and don't hesitate to follow us on our socials. We're very active on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So you're more than welcome to dive deeper together with us. So we all shape this symposium together and we hope to repeat the symposium. So we truly hope that we'll see you next time and enjoy your beautiful spring evening or spring day, wherever you are. Thank you all for joining us. Oh, we did it! We did it! Richard, <laughs> 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 lovely to 